relay. And I said, that's it. We're in a relay. And I'm handing my baton to Angelica. And I know she will not drop that baton. She will not. Whether she wins the race or not does not matter. It just matters that someone keeps going. And today is a, you know, we're not over, OK? I'm not dead or anything like that. But <laughs> there is a handing off of batons here. There's, there are things happening here. And, and then I end on uh, my segue for the Aster, who I don't say this very often. I would never want to follow him. <laughs> you know, usually I can follow anybody and you know, keep my balance. But really, seriously, the man can present. <laughs> and it was so interesting because Piazza, you started out with the word that has been much of my life, the altar. You know, it's, it's what I got well known from in the beginning, uh, whether it was the altar, which is the permanent ongoing record of the family at home, or the ofrenda, which is the ephemeral and temporary um, celebration of death. Uh, those sacred spaces, those vessels, was just so flawlessly beautiful as an image. And it held me all the way through. And so this idea of the pursuit, pursuit of the holy, the pursuit of beauty, and your embodiment, may I say, when you were showing your dance moves. <laughs> I almost got up with you. The, the exceedance of being, oh please, that, I'm gonna take it home and just take it everywhere with me. It's my new thing, I love that. Um, and the idea that the forms through which we express this exceedance of beauty are the key to what we make and who we make it with the form. And we, we use form in, in the arts very often, either in dance, and choreography, and music, in visual arts, you know, formalism, the form. But I think when he takes it in his voice, it gives us a great deal of hope. And um, the idea of the building, the building being animated through the archives, through the training models, this tension between the poetic and the pragmatic, the me, we, the bucket, I just left on this notion of a kind of soulfulness. And his pickling and preserving, which my mother did and I tried to learn and failed, it's just a perfect, it's really perfect, the preserving. And you talked about the natural and the artificial of the shelf life. Place over time, relationship over time, art over time. And I want to say that if every, someone ever asked me, how did this come about? Because you know all of us started in a path that no one could have expected and it wasn't set. I mean, I came up in a time where, I mean, I was in a place, a program called Teacher Corps, which had to do with bringing people of color into communities of color, and I was on a team with my team leader, Yolanda Garfiaswu, and it completely changed my life. She was a Oaxacanya Indian. She was the master of the ofrenda of the Day of the Dead, and she taught me everything I would ever need to know about culture. The things that my parents hid from me because they wanted me to be American, she had it all. It was like a living uh, heritage that I had access to, well, to this day. And so, you know, this idea that, that um, what, what Theaster called the soul's imaginary, and we use the term theoretically, the social imaginary, for quite some time. Uh, another one of those words that got exhausted because somebody finally gutted and used it for something it had nothing to do with. But the soul's imaginary, what, what is the difference between space making and place making? And, and really, in the end, the kind of energy that it takes us to get this work done, the fundraising. So everybody in that first group started out on a path that, that was not known to anyone else. What the Astra does, maybe it was done in some way before, but not that way. What Suzanne does, maybe somebody played around with performance, and, but not that way. And the same thing with Rick, not that way. But you don't know how it will happen. You don't necessarily have the skill sets when you start out. You make a lot of mistakes, you learn from other people. But the one thing that holds it all together, and that's why we're here today, is the idea of relationships. It is the people that you work with along the way, that you love along the way, that you break with along the way, that sometimes you leave behind or they leave you behind. Those are all part of those natural networks of what I think of as the organic making that we engage in. So we're very lucky now because we're going to hear a future vision. And that's not to say that this morning was, a, or was retrospective, because it was not. 
But the future vision comes from those who are either midway in their careers, beginning. And I know there are people here today that won't be presenting, but who are also equally as gifted and have made their mark already. It's simply not enough time for us. But hopefully, when we put our chairs in the circle and we're all together, those kinds of questions will arise. So uh, we're starting with Rick's posse, as I've been, it's been called. And I won't introduce people by their backgrounds because you have their bios here. And um, so Keir Johnson and Ernell Martinez from uh, Amber, Art and Design. Art, Amber and Design will speak first and do their presentation. Hello, everybody. Really happy to be here today amongst uh, such an audience. You know, it's really an honor. And uh, yeah, really happy to share today. You know, and we started with a slide of a great individual and predecessor of ours. We're talking about Bataan passing today. And you know, for us, there's, there's no better example than, than uh, this, this man right here, Terry Atkins. I don't, I don't think that I would know Ernell or we'd be doing quite what we'd be doing today if it wasn't for his influence, more so on Arnell, but very much so in passing on myself. We, when we started, we started in mural making and we started to branch off from that and we showed Terry some of our early works of collaboration, performance, whatnot, and he was a, a very early critic and influence on our, our collaboration. And, you know, we brought our work very early, so to, to Terry to look at it, and, you know, he, he has his own way of doing things, and, you know, he, uh, he thumbing through it, he was like, that's some bullshit, and, uh, <laughs> that's shit, and, that's some nigga shit, and, that's some nigga bullshit, you know, and, and then he get to one where he be like, well, that one's not that bad. And you know those those ones that weren't that bad have have really developed who we are and our, our practice up to this point. So, Terry, we thank you, and for letting us know what images uh, were not that bad. How does this work? Okay. Is that the first? Yeah. All right. So. Our first project is, is one called La Frontera. It took place in North Philadelphia. And I love North Philadelphia because it's a place where people are scared to go. You know? But what happens to those people uh, when, when the affluence of downtown aren't, aren't willing to invest in them? You know, so we, we work a lot with these communities. And we really look to, 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 to pull some of the stories that they, they naturally embody. And in this part of North Philadelphia, there's a divide between the, the Latin and black communities. And it's not a divide of conflict, but it is a divide of culture. And both sides are very aware of that divide. And like most communities of color, it's also a, a place with limited resources. Not a whole lot of access to art, not a lot of places of commerce, not a lot of places to shop. We had the pleasure of working with Gail at Asian Arts and, and, and developing a, a, a series on the Chinese takeout stores of a lot of the marginalized communities of Philadelphia. And this project, La Frontera, which means the border in Spanish, is an evolution of that project. And it, and it really is about giving people a cultural center in an environment that they're already uncomfortable with. So this is based off of bodegas in North Philly, all around Philly, and a bodega is where people of these communities go and do the majority of their shopping. What they don't do is go downtown to the museum to see the latest branches of culture and artwork. So we look to mesh that and mend those together and present a creative cultural uh, place setting that would allow these communities that are sep somewhat separated to really come together and share. Share their stories, share their lives. For some reason, this is not working. All right, there we go. And a way for, for young entrepreneurs to, to get their product out. We, had, we created a system of uh, non-monetary exchange, one based on barter. You come and you, you give a, a pamphlet, and you're able to get something that you would normally get in a bodega or something from a local vendor. 
And we also created a, a gallery and a, a place for convening. And all of this to create a comfortable environment, but something that represents the, the inter institutional and cultural exchange of, of the more downtown areas. And all this is, is based off of access and equity, because these places are the only places where, where people in these communities could actually go shopping and get something to eat. Similar with a project that we made that, 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 based, that was based off of the access of food and food as a, a, a real signifier of wealth and health. And so this, this variation of this project, we, we, we started a, uh, almost like a, a catering business, where again, a, a system of exchange allowed community members to take place in a four course meal that was based off of community recipes. But you had to come and give something in order to partake. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't handouts. So we were able to uh, really develop an ideal sense of uh, interaction through these type of places. And this is the, the corner store, which again is, is, is about replicating things in these communities that they're comfortable with, but in an essence that is more contemporary. So when they go to these exhibitions, they see something that is familiar, but yet it's a part of the community, but something foreign that, that allows them to think a little further on the information that's be, being presented to them that they take for granted in their everyday life exchange. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today. I want to make sure I take a moment to thank Carrie May, Holly, and everyone involved, Rick, uh, just to show our appreciation for allowing us to be a part of this conversation today. It's a very important conversation and dialogue that needs to take place. Um, so. With with a couple minutes, I'd like to just show you guys sort of an overarching sort of trajectory of our work as, as collaborators. Uh, Kira and I are collaborators, but there's also six other members to our collective, or four other members, six in total, who just aren't here today. And they're all wonderful artists uh, and, and brilliant artists, and it's been such a pleasure to sort of make work with them. Uh, so with that said, I'm going to show you guys just a series of performances uh, sort of inspired by narratives of communities, different communities. We've traveled around the country and we've created work uh, based on these specific communities and the stories uh, that they have to share. Uh, we've, and we've also, we've also used our bodies as, as a vehicle to sort of tell these stories. Uh, right here you're looking at a piece uh, uh, from a series we called Cleaning the Mansion, which is based out of a, a North Philadelphia neighborhood called Strawberry Mansion. Uh, this is a piece uh, called Urban Space Jockeys, uh, where you know, we get in attire and costumes and we do these performances in communities and we engage the community uh, through uh, sort of theatrical, sort of spectacle art. And uh, the conversations are amazing. If you look in the background, you see these young men who have no clue what we're doing, but they're very interested in what's going on. Uh, this is a, a group shot of a, of a piece we did at the PMA, Time is Short, uh, based on the, uh, the move bombing in Philadelphia. You guys are familiar with the move bombing. They dropped. Uh, incendiary bombs in the West Philadelphia neighborhood and killed uh, a dozen so people. And these are all the performances, uh, performers that, that collaborated with us at the museum, at the PMA, uh, trumpet players, singers, poets, uh, performing artists, and we all did a piece, and that's Ramona Africa right there on the far left, and she, she partook in that process as well. And we had this procession that led through the museum and all these performers would activate these different spaces at different times. It was all coordinated uh, through our collaboration. And on, just to end on a current project that we're working on, we're doing this series of, of, of podiums, and we're building podiums from found materials in different communities. And we're creating a, a, a platform for people to sort of share uh, the political, social, historical, whatever commentary they want to make. Uh, we just really want to engage people and, and give them a platform to speak up and share their voices. Uh, so that's what's going on now. And uh, we're going to be working with this project over the next year or so. But we're using social media as a component to promote uh, uh, people sharing their stories and narratives. All right, guys. Uh, before I step off, I'd like to ask uh, our, our, our mentors, our, all, all the senior heads in here, and, uh, to, when they get a moment to sort of share with us uh, what it's like to fail and what, what does that mean to you and sort of how do you overcome that? Because a lot of the work we've done over the years did not all look successful. Some were failures, and you've got to sort of figure out how to make that happen. All right? Thank you, guys.
thank you for being here and for the invitation. Um, what? Okay. What? Oh. <laughs> Sorry, this PowerPoint isn't working. Um, alrighty. So, uh, um, how do I start? How do I start? All right. Uh, so, my family emigrated to the U.S. when I was two in 1990. Um, and I think I've always been ambivalent about this idea of rootedness um, because we've always been entering into communities that were not ours. Um, so I think I've finally um, found my roots in a community um, that is based on this idea of unrootedness. But before that, I was working in Los Angeles for six years in public art on both the institutional level and also on the grassroots level. And I consider myself a chronic collectivizer. I'm trying to be much better about that. Uh, but so I organized a yarn bombing collective um, that did public projects, which is not present on the slide right now, um, as well as the Micheletta Think Tank, which is an art collective looking at racial equity in the arts through intervention and discursive gatherings. Um, and I kind of left that all behind to work with Rick in Dallas, Texas. So this is the first iteration of translation. Um, when it was commissioned by the Nasher Sculpture Center in 2013. So this is Rick's work in activating a community of 30,000 residents living in three square miles, all speaking 27 different languages. Um, and the reason that they speak 27 different languages is because this was a site that was designated for refugee resettlement by the International Rescue Committee. So uh, our residents are primarily from Southeast Asia, the Middle East, and North Africa but there's been different waves coming in over the past 10 to 15 years. And um, what the narrative of this neighborhood also neglects is that there's a huge African-American and Latino community as well from when this was converted into a Section 8 neighborhood in, I think, about the 1980s. So there's several waves of migration into this neighborhood, and there's a lot of different cultures kind of rubbing up against each other, which is incredibly poetic and beautiful, um, but challenging at the same time. And this is one of those more poetic move moments when Rick and Sarah Mercuria and Daryl Radcliffe um, hosted a Vickery Meadows Got Talent uh, talent show, um, showcasing the musical and performance talents of the residents. Um, and as someone who lived for 10 years in Austin, Texas, before making the exodus to Los Angeles, uh, I find it really necessary to explain Texas to people. Um, <laughs> so, uh, Dallas, Texas is one of the bluer areas of Texas, but it's also a city that exports its violence. So um, I moved to the city in May of 2015, and since then there's just, I mean, within seven months, there were these nationally um, recognized incidents of racial violence that I think most people don't put together as being part of the Dallas County area because the suburbs are named. So for example, McKinney is named or Irving is named or Arlington, but not the actual Dallas County itself. So this actually creates a really high, highly racialized, intense atmosphere that I think the actual city of Dallas, which is demarcated by the red lines, um, is in denial about. And that's why our existence is beautiful. Um, so right now, translation is in our third year, um, and our mission is we are a catalyst for highlighting the value cultural diversity adds to Vickery Meadows' identity, and we place this identity at the center of conversation about the neighborhood's future development by empowering residents through leadership development, workshops, trainings, cultural events, and entrepreneurial initiatives. And one reason that we focus on leadership and entrepreneurial development is because these three square miles are being choked in by gentrification efforts and we are actually in the northeast sector of Dallas, and we're separated from a lot of the anti-gentrification work that has historically been done in the southern sector of Dallas. So a lot of our work this year is to think through how do we actually empower residents to cultivate their bases, their leadership, and to have a voice, as well as to connect to these larger organizing efforts in Dallas.
Um, so this right now we operate out of a storefront at the heart of Vickery Meadow. This is an example of one of our classes. This is paper flower making and everyone is making flowers for our Dia de los Muertos event um, this past October. Uh, this was our August teaching core. So our philosophy behind leadership development is to really look at the talents and capacities that people have and that people bring with them when they migrate to this country. So we have Nasreen, our Arabic language leader, um, Ana, our Aztec dance jefa from Mexico City, who has this wonderful indigenous practice. Um, Abby, who was a circus performer um, in Ethiopia and um, volunteered to teach Ethiopian dance while running his cell phone business. Um, Alexa, who is trained in the fine arts in Ecuador, um, and Sara, who was a teacher and the maker of our signature beautiful paper flowers. Um, so right now we offer, yeah, shoot, we offer about 15 hours of programming every week and we also host an American Sign Language course for deaf and hard of hearing refugees, a youth-led zine club. They're making a zine about feminism this semester, so I'm super excited. Um, and also, yeah, an indigenous language class, Aztec dance, English as a second language, and basically our residents know that they can propose initiatives and that we will find the resources to support them and that we define our work in a broad cultural sense. So it doesn't need to be just about the visual arts, um, like what Alexa does with her painting and drawing class, but also with broader cultural issues such as, you know, language and driving and acculturation to the U.S. Um, by the way, you guys need to stop me because I can talk forever about this. Um, so this is an example of one of our public gatherings in front of one of three white cubes, which are our public exhibition spaces um, that were placed throughout the neighborhood to activate public space. It's a very dense apartment housing, so there's not a lot of public space opportunities. Um, and this is an example of a gathering that our indigenous leader, Ana, organized of 60 Aztec dancers from all over Texas for um, her troop's two-year anniversary. And fun fact, so when Ana started out, when we approached her, I think last December, um, they were just dancing in the park and freezing. So we said, come practice in our space. She had four people in her group, and through the support of translation, she's been able to grow her troop to over 25 people now. Um, they've since outgrown our space for practice, um, and she uses our space for education, for costuming. So all of their costumes were handmade. Um, because her troop couldn't afford a $400 costume. And it's just been this wonderful group of artisans led by one Hefa. Um, so one part that we do is leadership cultivation through cultural initiatives. And then the other aspect that we do is entrepreneurial development because this started as an artisan market and we wanted to honor that history of what Rick started. And also because it's a high poverty neighborhood and people are just looking for forms of supplemental income. So we work with this woman, Tisha Creer, who mainly works in South Dallas incubating cultural businesses to start a chef training program. Um, so we've successfully incubated five chefs who are continuing to get interest from investors in starting their own businesses. And our chefs hail from the Dominican Republic, um, Mexico, Eritrea, Egypt, and Iraq. Um, and the story that I always love to tell um, is that one of our chefs, after a catering event, she said she would now be able to buy winter clothes for her kids. And and I just looked at each other and cried and we were like you know what this like we both have a hundred dollars like that might not seem like a big deal to us but it's a really big deal to people so I think that's kind of beautiful and this is an example of an Eritrean dish which is full madamas um, cooked by Gadura, our groovy dude in the glasses who also happens to be an accomplished musician um, we also partner with other organizations and initiatives. So this was a community garden that was put in by the Hunt Institute at Southern Methodist University and um, populated by refugee gardeners from the International Rescue Commission. Um, so this is Booty. She's from Bhutan and she's one of our first pilot gardeners. And I always say I really love her because she looks like my maternal grandmother. It's kind of bonkers, but Booty's not bonkers, which is great. Um, <laughs> and to close out, uh, 
I think this is only a small slice of the really amazing talent and capacities existing in Vickery Meadow. And what I'm really excited about is we just got a grant for a storytelling program um, to start up a radio station. And this all happened because I met a woman named Afra, and she actually worked for Al Jazeera editing video documentaries in Yemen, um, and she was a human rights advocate who ran her own radio station. So she's just kind of here chilling with her one-year-old daughter now, but she just jumped at the chance to write community profiles. So this is an excerpt from one of her community profiles. It's about one of our residents, Latifa, who took our artisan classes. Um, and Latifa, I think, is from Tunisia and then married a man from Iraq but was separated from him for 11 years while they figured out how he got a visa to come to the United States. So Afra is going to continue in partnership with our community members to do more community profiles um, via radio, video, um, profiling, and really tell the story of this really amazing and unique community. So super lucky to be working here and so so happy to be connected to all of you and to talk more. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> I always say I, I don't freestyle, so be patient with me. I do some reading. Okay. Um, so yes, my name is Christina Sanchez Juarez. I'm a Los Angeles-based uh, teaching artist by day and a public artist and an organizer by night. Um, I'm going to uh, be speaking today about the Cocina Abierta project, um, in English translated to Open Kitchen. But before I start, I should say that the bulk of my emotional, spiritual, and intellectual work this year has actually been centered in the realm of organizing in particular around the issue of the human right to housing. Nine months ago, a group of artists, community organizers, and renters uh, formed the Los Angeles Tenants Union uh, to combat the rental crisis that is engulfing our city. I tell you this because I often panic about being too many things at once, being an artist with various civic responsibilities, uh, being a dependable organizer slash member of the tenant union, and then getting up every day at six in the morning uh, to teach young students uh, the habits of artists. I hope that at some point during um, the rest of our evening, um, we can talk about how we survive and embrace these um, dualities. Los Angeles is the largest restaurant industry in the country. Up until five days ago, the medium wage for a Los Angeles restaurant worker was $9.24 an hour. The average one bedroom apartment in LA right now costs $17.50 a month. Los Angeles is also the wage theft capital of the US with um, over $26 million stolen from workers on a weekly basis. I came to this work uh, through my husband, he's pictured here. Kaye migrated from Oaxaca when he was 17 years old and has been working in California kitchens ever since. Um, he's seen it all, meager wages, discrimination, blatant wage theft, and a lack of upward mobility. Cocina Abierta began as a performative storytelling project in 2011. Calle and I wanted to meet and interview as many immigrant back-of-house workers as possible. At first, these testimonies were incorporated into performance scores, which were performed in community spaces, colleges, and labor pickets. Later, the project became more about highlighting Cocina Abierta collective members, giving professional cooks and servers a space where they could try out new recipes and hone their organizing skills. We describe Cocina Abierta as a nomadic experimental test kitchen. We use the food as a catalyst for relationship building, um, transformative dialogue, and base billing. The work is done in collaboration with a small rotating group of restaurant workers, organizers, and artists. Um, we've worked in collaboration uh, with the Restaurant Opportunity Center of Los Angeles, also known as Rock LA, on various Cocina Abierta projects and have been um, active members of, of the organization as well. Rock LA is a worker center dedicated to winning improved working conditions and raising industry standards for LA restaurant workers. This is where we've met and cultivated many of the relationships with the workers who cook with us and spearhead, um, and spearhead projects with us. The images I've shown you thus far are from um, our latest collaboration. 
a series of dinners um, slash conversations for and by restaurant workers. In June, we teamed up with, Rock LA le with the Rock LA Leadership Board, which is comprised of both uh, front of house and back of house workers, to ho host a four course meal. Uh, the guest list was completely made up of um, fellow restaurant workers. The main impulse for the dinners was to provide restaurant workers with a beautiful eating environment where folks could break bread and discuss some of the most pressing um, workers' rights issues. Um, I'm going to switch gears a bit here. Um, last year, after spending a few years working exclusively on labor themes um, within the restaurant industry, um, I went and scored myself um, a public art commission with um, the County of LA. Uh, Cocina Abierta is currently um, stationed at Victoria Park in Carson. We are commissioned by the LA Arts uh, Commission and LA Parks and Rec to spend a year in the park um, investigating how food can deepen cross-cultural alliances. Uh, funding for the project actually comes from graffiti, um, creative graffiti abatement funds. Um, Victoria Park is a 36-acre recreational facility featuring a gym, um, basketball diamonds, a cricket field, tennis courts, a pool, football, basketball courts, you get the picture, 18-hole golf, golf course. It's a very sporty place, and I'm not that sporty, but I've um, adjusted. Um, <laughs> in addition to being an, an incredible uh, resource of sports activity and, op and an open space, it's a beautifully uh, multi-ethnic uh, community with African-American, Samoan, Latino, and Southeast Asian peoples represented in the park usership. Our initial um, approach was to get to know the community. Um, to get to know the community was to immerse ourselves in park culture. We attended softball games, peewee football practice, as well as urban ballroom and Zumba classes. Uh, we conducted numerous one-on-one -on -one interviews with park staff and volunteer coaches and park users. Um, we've also hosted recipe swaps in the park, um, built an advisory council, and invited ourselves to a lot of potlucks. Uh, the Recipe Swap Lab doubled as both a cookbook library and a place of exchange. We set up a library during the Pee Wee football practice and during the, the every year they have this annual Thanksgiving potluck. Uh, we worked as scribes, jotting down community members' recipes, as well as giving away pre-printed recipes of our own. Through this process, we began to identify the folks that we refer to as community chefs. Now, a community chef isn't anyone that's been to Le Cordon Bleu or anything like that. They're... <laughs> Um, everyday people who are known in the community for being good cooks, giving people really, people like Veronica Zuniga, who whipped up 271 enchiladas for a Thanksgiving potluck. The research and development phase um, led us to propose the development of a community cooking show uh, in the Victoria Park kitchen. So this is really why I was selected for this project. They have a kitchen. Um, five community chefs were selected and paired up with uh, restaurant workers from our collective to film cooking instructionals. Each profile features a community cook showing a restaurant worker how to make a dish from start to finish. The restaurant workers serve as co-hosts asking questions about techniques, food history, cultural upbringing, and their relationship to the park. Um, I think there's another one. Uh, the profiles will be screened for the larger park community in the spring. The hope is that the screening will serve as an impetus for organizing a massive community potluck slash food festival that brings together the park's um, diverse cultural groupings for a day of celebration. Um, and there's also, uh, paired with this, I've also been working on a, a beautification project with an architect named Carmen Cham. Um, these are the kids for the from the Los Angeles Conservation Corps. Um, so, um, yeah, we're installing a cookbook library, making um, some different types of modifications to the space, adding chalkboards, cork boards, um, outdoor graphics to um, some picnic tables, an outdoor projection, projection screen, and all of this stuff is going to be kind of launched with uh, the screening of the cooking show. Um, these are amazing kids. Thank you. <laughs> And uh, the next of Suzanne's colleagues is Tanya Ingram. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Tanya Ingram, and I am a performance poet. Um, I attended NYU and received my bachelor's degree in social justice education through performance poetry. 
Um, I am currently pursuing my MFA in public practice at Otis College of Art and Design, which is how I got the invitation to be here from Suzanne. Um, my work focuses on using my lived experience to aid in my own process of healing and in the process of healing for others. My practice is the personal. I have taught workshops at Rikers Island and in classrooms throughout the United States and in Ghana, West Africa. My goal is to bring my poetry into hospitals where I, f where I, ha where I have found this to personally um, be necessary. Um, so with that, I'm going to share two poems. Um, the first poem is Ode to Walton Avenue, and it's about the Bronx, New York, which is where I'm from. And often when I hear of the Bronx from others, there's often this idea of this terrible place, so I decided to write about it from a place of beauty. Um, so this is Ode to Walton Avenue. Ode to Walton Avenue, where I'm from, we smoke in staircases that paint the walls transparent. We block parties on school nights where mom watches from the window because the Air Jordans on your feet was next month's rent. We are what's good. We don't see butterflies in the hood, but we do ask the Chino for more ketchup on our fries. We are hydrants drinking ourselves dry. A mother's first of the month smile where grocery shopping is a sacred enterprise. We are the witness, never the snitch. We trust mercy will find us on a swing set, so we push the wind behind us and kiss the space between back and forth, hoping to welcome the clocks on our wrists. We are barking mad pit bulls that our time has become. We are 15 and brother, and trial after trial, and when will they come home? We are not home for Jehovah. We are careful adulterers creeping up the back staircase, proving human enough to validate every mistake before we die like our memories, before the exit plan unfurls. We seal our lungs into plastic containers and reserve the option to breathe. We are feeling a bullet on the new year. Where having a front window in the Bronx is like scoring front row seats to a Knicks game without the home court advantage, a street fight after cousin JoJo's Sweet 16, a holy brawl amongst royalty, an illusion injected into boombox, a magical stereo, Big June's mixtape, or un servicio en la iglesia de Dios. If the God we serve ain't packing, then we don't believe. We are the watchtower of thieves and spectators. We speak the language of boondock and rat pack nomads wearing the block in our bloodstream we are divine and hood and welcome i left these doors open for you come in thank you and the second poem is a list of advice that i would give myself um, and I found this poem to be most impactful whenever I read it to, um, to students. Um, and it's called Unsolicited Advice to Skinny Girls with Bitten Nails and Awkward Glances, after Jean Ann Verley. When your best friend's father invites you over, say no. When the girls at school tease you for wearing payless light-ups, do not wrench your face, smile, then tie your laces. When you finally learn how to Dougie, and it's 2011, show off to everyone you know. When you finally learn how to do the original Harlem Shake, and it's 2011, keep it to yourself. When your mother asks you to buy her a pregnancy test, do not slam the door behind you. Do not snatch the 20 from your birthright when she says she is pregnant. Do not sacred suck your teeth. Do not wholly roll your eyes when the boy with the intrusive shadow calls you a white girl. Do not cower your head. Do not question your black when your grandmother says you act like an old lady. Take it as a compliment. Set the teapot, knit the turtleneck, check on the apple pie. When the next NYU student asks to touch your hair, 
laugh, then ask if you can touch theirs. When your best friend's father invites you over, say no. When you catch your brother with a porno, act surprised, laugh it off, do not call him a sinner. When your mother asks why you take so long in the shower, tell her you hate this cancer, this dark that wears you like a plague. When you discover your grandmother is bipolar and schizophrenic, hug her. Then Google each illness when you question if you are anything like her, hug your Yourself, then Google each illness when you cry in front of your brother because he has just learned you are not his full sister. Do not slump your shoulders. Your eyes are a well the thirsty crave pour into him. When you visit your brother at Rikers Island, do not blink to hold back the tears. You are Moses. He is the miracle. This is the Red Sea. When your mother brings your sister home from the hospital, do not hide your hands. Do not fear you will drop her. She is a medallion and a collection plate of screws treasure her when the older woman with silver hair and loose teeth calls you a nigger give her the finger Give her Jay-Z's The Blueprint. Give her the word of God. When your mother's ex-boyfriend puts his hands on your brother's, grab the chair. When your mother's ex-boyfriend puts his hands on your sister, grab the frying pan. When your mother's ex-boyfriend puts his hands on your mother, grab the phone, grab the knife, grab your voice. This is Armageddon. This is taken back what the devil has stolen. Do not fear, do not cower, do not question. When your best friend's father invites you you over say no you are resurrection you are silence turned shotgun and death has no place here thank you and the next presenter that is with Suzanne is Adaku Uta Peace, everybody. <laughs> Carrie, Holly, uh, Suzanne, it is such an honor. Again, thank you. I can't say enough um, how wondrous and important and necessary this space is uh, for folks like me. My hands are open for the baton, so please, please, please keep passing them along. Um, I'd like to begin and also close with a uh, community act of resistance. So I wanna invite you to bring your right hand to your heart and your left hand to two inches below your belly button. And on your next inhale, I want you to take in 30% more oxygen into your cells and 30% more out of your cells. And do that again and bring even more oxygen into your body, into your mind, into your spirit. And exhale out. And on the next inhale, I want you to tell yourself that you matter. And then turn over to someone next to you and tell them that they matter. and really mean it. <laughs> Thank you. We live right now um, and have always lived really uh, in a, a time where our breath, breathing, waking up, choosing to be alive is an act of resistance. There is so much even in our dreams that are actively trying to kill us. And so every moment that we intentionally breathe and every moment that we intentionally tell ourselves that we matter and move from that truth, and every moment that we look at our neighbors, whether we know them or not, that they matter and treat them, treat them like the humans that they are and the, the divinity that they are, that is an intentional act of resistance against patriarchy, against racism, against ableism, against homophobia, and that, kind of work is what I have been up to for my entire life. And I feel really fortunate and honored to call myself a healer, a liberation educator and organizer, and a performance artist. But most of all, I am somebody who loves really, really big. And um, ever since I was little, my goal really is to make 
love, as Khalil Gibran said, to make love really visible in every single act that I do. Harriet's Apothecary is one of my love children. Um, it is a collaboration with Harriet Tubman, who this work is named after, and it's also a collaboration with my ancestors that have descended, that I have descended from. Um, I feel very fortunate enough to, to say that I am a first generation Nigerian. I'm an Igbo woman who grew up in Nigeria and come from a long line of healers and organizers and, and communists who have dedicated their lives to serving for um, liberation. So Harriet's Apothecary is many things. Uh, it is an underground railroad to freedom led by the indigenous wisdom of our ancestors and it's based here in Brooklyn and our work this year or last year, we started in 2014. Last year our work had the opportunity to travel across the country and um, into the palms and hearts of, of IT and also Kenya. Harry's Apothecary is a response to the direct and indirect forms of violence that black, indigenous, and people of color every day, from gentrification to mass, mass incarceration, to police brutality, to depression, to being raped, to being abused in the nonprofit industrial complex, we are a response to that. We are a manifestation of a legacy of healing justice, a framework where we get to build political and philosophical convergences of healing inside of liberation. And we are rooted in the resilience and the oppressive experiences of those who are actively resisting to create a life that we deserve. Harris Apothecary is an intergenerational collective of an all black team, and I love saying that, an all black team, of cis women and queer and trans healers and activists who are following the legacy of Harriet Tubman to create liberation in our tissues um, and also within our communities. We seek to transform trauma and um, relieve stress and really recognize that our work, um, we recognize that we are all traumatized, every single one of us on a daily basis. We are constantly on an individual and collective way um, experiencing direct and non-direct exposures to violence and how that manifests inside of us and around us is huge. So from a headache to having fibroids, I am the fourth generation of women in my family that has fibroids and that's not a coincidence. Um, to living in organizations or working in nonprofits, which I've worked in for the last 20 years, um, where people are actually not doing what they say that they are doing, that their values and their practice, there's much, much distance. And so we want to interrupt that. <laughs> we want to interrupt that significantly, and the work that we do does just that. So how do we do this? And these are a number of our healers um, in our collective. There are 22 of us, um, and each of our healers has um, very different magical powers, as I like to say. Um, some identify as organizers, some identify as Reiki masters, some identify as um, anti-colonial therapists, the list goes on. Audre Lorde said many things best. <laughs> Caring for ourselves is not, uh, not self-indulgence, it is self-preservation, and this is an act of political warfare. We, in the work that we do, are participating in an act, many, many acts of political warfare. This is us um, uh, on the Brooklyn Bridge, cleansing the city, <laughs> cleansing the city of its history of colonialism and its history of mass incarceration against black and indigenous and folks of color. So we get to show our love in many, many different ways. Um, one of the main ways that we get to show love in our community is through our healing villages. Uh, we, throughout the year, create these seasonal healing villages that bring together our healing um, artists and organizers and offer individual and collective healing spaces where people can interrogate the healing genius of their vessels and also critically analyze how these systems of oppression and injustice are affecting them on a physical, emotional, and spiritual basis. We had the honor of being invited this past year by Brooklyn Museum um, on first Saturdays in March, which is Women's History Month. And uh, first Saturdays, how many people have been to first Saturdays? <laughs> 
a couple of y'all. So for those who haven't been to First Saturdays, it's a free event on a Saturday that draws about 10,000 people. This was our first event last year. And the year before, which is when we started, our reach, um, we had only four seasonal healing villages and every single healing village had anywhere from 150 to 300 people. Um, when Brooklyn Museum invited us to meet an audience of 10,000, we were very nervous and we also said we were ready. And um, we also told Brooklyn Museum that we hope that you're ready for us. Because when we come into a space, we reclaim that space and we take up space as black people, especially as black women and queer and trans folks who are often told to be small. Um, we said, no, <laughs> we're not gonna be small. This is a white institution and we're gonna come in here with our full blackness and bring in our indigenous practices. And we're gonna interrogate, interrogate how whiteness occupies the space at a museum and also in our streets in Brooklyn. So right here, this is our, actually our closing ceremony. We started off with uh, an opening ritual and a closing ritual. Um, but throughout the night, we had uh, 25 different healing stations that people could participate in, from sound healing to guided meditation to doing vision boarding around what does resilience mean for your inside of your body? And what does resilience and safety mean for Brooklyn in a state where anti-black racism is vastly growing and huge? Um, we had sessions on um, using acupressure as a tool to deal with um, rape, being a survivor of rape. We had sessions where people had an opportunity to learn how to ground themselves in the face of microaggressions in your organizations. So this was these, all these stations were spread throughout um, Brooklyn Museum. And we also had a space that was only for black people which was uh, a struggle with Brooklyn Museum because first Saturday is 10,000 people. They said, you know, um, our people like to be anywhere. And I'm like, well, white people like to be everywhere. And <laughs> it doesn't mean that they're gonna get to, to be everywhere. And so we, we, we intentionally created a space just for black people um, to talk about how to heal from anti-black racism here in Brooklyn. And we feel really grateful that Brooklyn Museum agreed with us and really trusted us because this is the first time that they were able to do something like this. And at the end of the year, got invited by Andrew Lehman, um, who is the founder and creator of First Saturdays, and we were um, named as one of the top uh, First Saturday programs ever in the history of First Saturdays. So the community is our heartbeat. Um, when we started in 2014, one of the things that we wanted to do was really listen to what the needs are of the communities in which we serve. And one of the significant things that a lot of people named that they wanted was a space where they couldn't only just go and receive healing services, but really learn these concrete tools that they can take back with them to their organizations, to their homes, to their classrooms, um, to their universities. Folks wanted to know, how can I increase my own healing powers? People wanted to know, you know, my abuelita, my great, great, great grandmother used to use herbs back in the day. I really want to connect with that wisdom. I want to remember the story of my own DNA beyond slavery, because we know that slavery and colonialism creates an amnesia that sometimes can be resuscitated, and we want to resuscitate that wisdom. And so we created our, our freedom schools, which we launched this year. And our freedom schools are spaces to do just that, where people can have intentional dialogues, do workshops, uh, create strategic planning sessions, and really take all this healing wisdom and artistic wisdom back into the, the spaces where they come from. This, um, <laughs> this right here is an example of one. Um, Chelsea Renee Long is, is leading a session on creating um, herbal medicine for folks who are uh, queer and trans folks who are moving through transitions in their bodies. I should name that um, Harriet's Apothecary, so our, we're based here in Brooklyn, and the space in, in which we hold most, if not all, of our, our healing uh, work is at Black Women's Blueprint, um, which is based in Crown Heights. They are a civil rights and human rights organization working to end sexual violence against black women and trans um, folks. They also, inside of Black Women's uh, Blueprint, Blueprint Space, also hosts the Museum of Women's Resistance. So we feel really fortunate that the space, the container that we get to do the work is, is healing in itself. So every winter, capitalism um, just rises. <laughs> um, and we 
believe in cooperative economics. We, be, we believe in bringing the money that we make back into the hands and hearts of our people. So every winter for the last two years, we've created a holiday bazaar and swag swap that intentionally um, has vendors and healers that specifically identify as black indigenous folks of color and who identify as cis women and queer and trans folks because we know that in the market, folks that look like us and folks that have our identities don't have the opportunity to have their work celebrated and also to get money for their work. And so this past year, we, the first year we started off with 15 um, vendors. This, this year, actually, December 20th, we had 27 vendors um, who were selling their own, every, every single artist made their own thing, which was really incredible. And some artists, um, it was the first time that they ever sold what it was that they made. And for other artists, they've been selling since they were little. Um, and so we had things, as you can see, from um, Color Girl Hustle Hard mixtapes to um, scarves, to uh, yoni steams, uh, to decolonization herbalism textbooks, learning how to make your own medicine. So there's a range um, of beautiful, beautiful, powerful work. We um, have also been getting invited to do training and consulting both nationally and internationally. So earlier I mentioned that what, one of the things that we see um, as activists, as people who are dedicated to movement building work, is that we are not immune to systems of oppression. So from the moment that we come out of the womb, we are socialized to be destructive. We are socialized to be, um, to be not who we are, to not live in our birthright. And so a lot of organizations have been coming to us asking us, how can we actually meet our vision in an embodied way? How do we do that? Um, and also, how do we stop ourselves from reinforcing these very specific injustices that we're seeing out in the world? So I was giving Carrie Mae earlier an example of how you know, organizations work, uh, or people in and, and organizations, um, have to constantly face different kinds of microaggressions from racism to sexism, or how many folks here work 80 hours a week and you're not sleeping and you haven't seen your family. And having that impact insomnia um, on your body is actually impacting how you're treating your staff, or it's impacting how you're choosing to listen to your fellow colleagues, or it's impacting how you choose to see yourself. And so in our work with organizations, what we do is we create spaces um, and strategic conversations and trainings and retreats for people to do some necessary healing work so they can actually embody what it is that they say that they're doing. We've had the opportunity to do this with uh, folks like Black Lives Matter. Patrice Marie Colors happens to be a really, really good friend of mine. And uh, we got invited this year to work with um, all the Black Lives Matter chapters across the country. They hosted their first retreat in Detroit this summer, and um, we led the healing efforts with them. We also got invited last year uh, to, or the year before, uh, to the first ever um, Black Lives Matter Freedom Ride to Ferguson, uh, where there's over 500 people coming from across the country to stand in solidarity with activists. And we led the healing justice efforts there, building a day and a half community clinic for activists and organizers to heal from the impacts of their work. Um, and to heal from the impacts of living as a person of color in this country. Uh, most recently, in November, we partnered with the Estrella Foundation. So Estrella Foundation is the only organization across the world that specifically funds LGBTQI organizing work. And they have a new initiative with the USAID called Comms Labs, where they work with international grantees to support them in developing their capacity around communications technology. And for some folks, healing. So. This past November, they were in Kenya and South Africa, and we got invited to coordinate the wellness track um, to build a healing village for the activists there and also lead workshops around sustainability. And for us, when we talk about sustainability, we don't talk about necessarily the length of how long our work is, but we talk about actually how do we live <laughs> through what we, want to we, we are doing and also how do we match um, what we say with actual practice. 
So Harry's Apothecary is an intergenerational village, and that is intentionally so. We see far too often inside of our work that there is distance between elders and young people. And we want to, like you, <laughs> continue passing on the baton. So we have apprenticeships throughout the year with young people, supporting them in increasing their own healing powers and organizing strategies in the community. Um, this is to the right over here is um, Emily, who is uh, a junior right now at Panoma College, and she was an apprentice last year, and she's going to be bringing Harry's Apothecary. She's going to be doing her own healing village in California this year. This is um, some portraits of our work throughout. This is in Haiti, um, working with um, survivors of violence, um, specifically sexual violence. And we created a number of different healing remedies. Um, this town in Leogan does not have a clinic. The closest clinic is about two hours away. And so we worked with local herbalists and artists to create herbal medicine that was specific to um, the young women and older women's needs. And they were able to create that and also pass that knowledge on. Um, Patrice, our work in Ferguson, we got to go back to Ferguson again this year for, for a week or this past year for a week to do healing work there and then at the African Burial Grounds with Black Youth um, Project. So our work really thrives on collaboration. Um, we really believe in family. We, we uh, are grounded in interdependence. And so please, please come connect with us. This is how one of the many ways, besides talking to me, um, that you can get connected to our work. Thank you so much for bearing witness um, to this. And I look forward to continuing this conversation. And as I'm walking to my seat, take another breath and tell yourself that you matter. Thank you so much. Uh, we have Carrie's colleague, Lonnie Graham, next. Oh, good heavens. My name's Lonnie Graham. You know that. It's an honor and a privilege to be here. Thank you. I'm worried about issues of marginalization and access. I was uh, trained primarily as a regular kind of an artist, one of those people that's supposed to sit in their studios and make stuff and then hope for the best, I guess, and put the rest under the bed or put most of it under the bed and then hope for the best. So ultimately, because of something that happened to me in Japan, I was visited by some of the ancestors. And it came to me at that point that I started to need to make stuff that, that people could access, that people could understand, that when people saw it, they would be able to relate it to something that they could see and recognize in their own lives every day. So at that time, I had an opportunity and was able to make this kind of an installation back in the 1990s that when people were able to see it, they could walk into it and they could, this was for my, my Aunt Dora, they could, it would be a full sensory, pers it would just use all your, all your senses. You could see it, you could hear it, you could smell it, you could sit in it. You could enjoy who Aunt Dora was. You could watch Ed Sullivan on television and listen to Louis Armstrong on the radio, which is what it was like to be in my place because I would see these things in museums where you could see Marie Antoinette's chest of drawers and enjoy them. And I thought that it was important that you would be able to see our folks' stuff the same way that you could see everybody else's stuff that was held in high esteem. It started to make sense, this issue of accessibility. Given that, I wanted to make sure that I was starting to address other things that made sense to people. And other, th and other things that were important. I started to work on this spiritual thing, right? This living in the spirit house. So 
I thought, okay, well, what's important to people? What are the most essential aspects of our human condition? You got your spiritual thing, and then you've got the body, and you've got the mind, so you've got the mind and the body and the spirit. So if you need to feed the body, then you have to get some food. So I had been working in Kenya and with a farmer who was growing food for his family in the same way that I was working with my uncle in Pennsylvania who was growing food for his family. At that point, I took food, well, I took a bunch of people from the United States over to Kenya. I took a bunch of Kenyans from Kenya to the United States. I had this African-American garden project that worked for a long time and spawned many other gardening projects that would have to do with, with of course, community access, but it had to do with, with feeding people. The, those garden projects kept food on some people's tables. It enlightened other people. We, we, kept, we kept schools open. It turns out that many of the young people in schools that we built gardens for simply weren't nourished. They weren't getting proper nutrition. So that once they started to grow these gardens in their school grounds and use the food in the course of their daily lives, their test scores went up. When the test scores go up, the principals look better. When the principals look better, they get funding. The schools stay open. It started to make sense on some level. So I was acting as a facilitator in many, in many, of, those, in many of those projects. This one, where I built this little, it's like, it's like, a, little, it's like a little store inside of the museum. It had to do with people that were sharecroppers and lived out in the Carolinas, people that had sort of suffered at the hands of, of other individuals who lost or who were able to gain from their losses. So it's kind of along the lines of food, but had more to do with honoring all of those individuals that had sacrificed in terms of trying to make a living for themselves. This is another one of those institutions where, or instances, where it becomes a metaphor, it becomes a symbol of people that had suffered a loss. This was in, in Philadelphia, in a community that had lost the place where they had held sacred. So I built this little building so that they were able to go and have weddings and have christenings and have a place to go where they felt safe. This we, you know, we, we got the, the place where their church used to be, and we made, this, we made this little building so that they could address their, their, what the community thought was their sacred selves. I thought that was important for them. Okay. Yeah, this was one of those, this is in Youngstown, Ohio. We, there were people that just didn't get along. There were people that lived on one side of town and they didn't get along with the people that lived on the other side of town. And the community government in Youngstown built this huge community center right in the middle, hoping that you know, these young people would go into it and use it, and they didn't. They weren't interested at all. So I had to go, they called me for some reason. And I had to go in and try to activate both sides of the community to go in and use this facility to kind of help to validate the local government in some way. So I just went and I talked to them. I did something that I had been doing for many years. In 1985, I started this project called A Conversation with the World that I'll talk about in a couple of minutes. But I didn't do anything except go talk to people. I stood around and I asked people what was important to them and I photographed them. And I brought all of those photographs and I stuck them into this facility. In order for the people to see the photographs, they had to go in. It wasn't really complicated. It was, <laughs> it was just a matter of going and talking to some people that I guess other people were too afraid to talk to, maybe. 
Yeah. E. So in in San Francisco, they asked me to come over and have this conversation with the world that I had been doing, like I said before, with some people that lived in San Francisco. So I didn't do anything any more complicated than standing around and, you know, as I encountered individual in the streets, I would photograph them and I would take a little tape recording of them and I would record their words. I would visit people in their homes and I would sit and I, they would invited me in for tea and I would talk to them and I would record their words and I would take their pictures. I would give them their photographs. I engage with these individuals. And it turns out that a conversation with the world, and I'm gonna take a minute and I'm gonna tell you about this thing, because what, what starts to happen to me was something that was like, it was like, a, it was a revelation. I mean, I've had many, right? But this was a particular revelation because what started to happen is I started the project in 1985. I talked to a bunch of people up until around 1990 and it didn't make any sense. I thought it was, I thought it was kind of stupid, right? Because I'm talking to all of these people all over the place and they're, and they're all telling me the same thing. And I thought, this is dumb. This is a dumb project. I'm gonna put it down. So I put the stupid thing down. And then, you know, every now and then, I would go back and I'd try it again. You know, if I would go someplace, I'd go to New Guinea, or I'd go to South Africa, or I'd go to Kenya or something, right? And I'd, I'd bring it out, I'd get the tape recorder and I'd get the camera and I'd take some pictures and I'd ask people questions. <clears throat> it's the same stupid, I, you know, it's the same answers. And I thought, this is dumb. Let's forget about it. So I'm in Mali. I'm going to tell you a story. So I'm in Mali, right? And I'm on top of this big mud building, this beautiful thing. And I'm talking to an imam. And I asked him the questions because they're the same questions. I thought that if I had like the same questions, it would be kind of like a template, right? That I would take this template of questions and I could just ask a whole bunch of people the same questions and then they could respond. And then that way I could just, like I'm a professor, right? So I needed like a way for people, I needed to have you know, a way to measure and a way to judge to sort of justify my research. And I thought, okay, so I'm sitting up there on top of this building and I asked this, you know, this religious person these, these questions and he answers the questions and he answers the questions the same way that this little guy in Mexico answered the questions. I went into a little hut in Mexico. The guy had made a, a building from earth. You know, there was a similarity. There's two earthen buildings. There was a very humble individual that had his, his, his animal parked outside the building. I made my way inside this dark room. He invited me in. I asked him the questions. He answered them. I'm sitting across the world in another hemisphere on top of a religious building. And I asked the imam the questions. And he answers the same way. Okay. I'm in Japan. I'm in the northern part of Japan. And I asked this, this woman who's living on a farm in the north. I'm in South Africa. And I asked this South, I'm on the other side of town in Cape Town. And I asked a white South African the same, same answers. I'm thinking, what the heck? What the heck? What the heck? I can be in any part of the world. I can ask any person the same questions. They're giving me the same answers. If I'm getting the same answers from everybody around the world about the same questions that has everything to do with the essential aspects of human nature, if I can ask anybody in this room I'm getting the same answer from everybody around me. What's the problem? I ask you. They invited me to Calgary. I asked the Native Americans. These guys, they had a problem. 
they wanted people to understand what their problems were. They asked me to help them. I asked them the questions. They answered the questions. They put the questions up on billboards downtown, just like these people in Somalia did. Oh, no, no, oh, I beg your pardon. These aren't Somalians. These are refugees. These are Finnish people. These people live above the Arctic Circle in Finland. This is where the refugees wind up in Finland. I asked them the questions. They had issues. They wanted to be heard. Sadly, oh, they got heard. Sadly, many of the people that I worked with in this population were killed because of xenophobia. But I talked to them. I put the questions out. They wanted me to do the same thing in New Zealand. I did that. These young people wanted other people in their community to understand what remains important to them as an indigenous community. So I put them up, we put them up on billboards. The, those projects continue. You can look online. I'm just a facilitator. I just want people to understand how and why and what's important for human beings in the world. Why it's important that we can all exist. Why it's important that I can ask everybody the same questions and their answer in the same way. That's my conversation with the world. Thanks. get this down a little bit. All right, so um, my name is Angelica Murrow or Angelica Muro, which is the duality that I experience on a daily basis being raised in um, a society essentially that heavily promotes and values assimilation. And so um, I really felt a connection to everything that you were talking about in terms of socializing and conditioning. Um, and also connecting values to practice. And so what I'm going to do is talk about myself as an educator today, because I feel that that's really important in terms of how it is that we are teaching community engagement or social practice, especially in a program um, that I'm in. So I'm a professor and chair of the Visual and Public Art Department at Cal State Monterey Bay in Seaside, California. The Visual and Public Art Department or program or major, VPA is a hands-on program that brings together studio and community art. In my role as faculty and chair, I develop curriculum, manage various public art projects and explore historical analysis, individual aesthetics and community collaboration. <clears throat> Issues of community access and community change are at the forefront of creating art that is meaningful to both VPA students, faculty and community. We emphasize communities and bridging the many social and cultural disconnects within the Monterey and Santa Cruz counties that surround us, such as examining social political issues like gender, race, social economic class, and sexuality. So here we have um, a few projects that I've worked on with my students through, through service learning. So in terms of my craft, my wheelhouse is integrated media and photography. So that means media culture, digital public art, digital and analog photography. But our program collectively also supports mural and painting, sculpture and installation, performance art, museum studies, and arts education. We're a really small department, which means that we fluctuate and vacillate between maybe 80 to 100 students at any given semester. And so we work very closely with our students and pride ourselves in valuing reciprocity, ethical inquiry, and self-reflection. So overseeing an academic program that continu continually engages in dialogues of community access and community change is challenging, to say the least, um, as is the recruitment of students who are interested in social practice, which brings up larger questions related to public art practices in rural areas, and more importantly, what are the social issues of import to millennials living in a rural area? 
So the last question brings me to a project that I'm currently working on with the Center for Community Advocacy. Um, and so for this partnership, um, I'm working with um, an agency that essentially is promoting um, housing conditions or unhealthy housing conditions of farm workers that are living in the Santa Cruz and Monterey counties. Um, and so what the community, Center for Community Advocacy does, I'll just call it CCA, is they shed light on the challenges of housing within regional farm worker communities. This is directly tied, or this project is directly tied to an upper division service learning digital public art course where students learn about oral history as well as video production and you know, digital photography, digital arts. So um, the reason why we partnered with CCA is because they've been known for about the last 20 to 25 years as a champion for social change for various farmer communities. They're based out of Salinas, California, and I don't know how many of you are familiar with Salinas, but it's a, an agricultural hub. Um, some call it the salad bowl because of, of the, the main industry that's produced out of there, which is um, the spinach that you eat and the lettuce that you eat is most likely from the Salinas Valley. Um, and so it's the world's uh, largest municipality um, of, of agriculture. Um, and it's the largest city in Monterey County, but it's also incredibly demonized in the media for its large Latino population, excessive gang violence, and crime rate, which are all symptoms of a system that prevents children of agricultural workers from overcoming the social economic class that they were born into. So for this partnership, um, we are documenting the living conditions of farm workers through video and interviews that emphasize the effects of inadequate housing on health and everyday life. So surprisingly, even though CCA has been an advocacy group that's been along for a long, a long time, they have very little resources and aren't very tech savvy and don't really have um, a whole lot of artists that they work with before in terms of actually documenting um, the, the various issues that they're dealing with. Um, so our idea was to essentially externalize the living spaces through using uh, projection in public spaces. Um, we did have a, also a partnership with Destination Salinas um, to activate downtown Salinas, which is experiencing uh, revitalization like everything else. And so that like the housing in California, as, as has been talked about earlier, um, is incredibly uh, expensive. And so with this comes all kinds of revitalization and, and that's what's happening with, with downtown Salinas where the housing um, costs have, have um, soared. And so again, so CCA has um, little documentation to work with. Um, and so we, we'd like to, uh, like I said, put, put these images, these videos, these stories into public spaces to facilitate a conversation about issues of equality in the larger Salinas community. Um, and so this in particular um, was of interest to both the CCA program and the visual and public art program. So the Center for Community Advocacy um, connects us with tenants of, house, of the housing communities they consider to be amongst the worst and therefore in need of documentation. And so um, this is a trailer park located in King City, California. Uh, King City is a small town in the Central Valley with approximately a population of 13,000. Um, and has experienced really slow economic growth in the last 50 years. Like most towns in a rural agricultural-based area, King City has a large yet underserved Mexican-American population. The lack of political representation is evident in terms of its limited resources. It is difficult to find employment outside of field work, which most refer to as trabajando en el fil. I myself grew up on a migrant camp in California, San Joaquin Central Valley. This is a valley that's one of the largest producers of agriculture in the world, yet home to a large group of underserved, underprivileged, underrepresented Latinos, where many live below the poverty line in subpar migrant camps with their entire family. So the problem here is that many of these camps were intended to house only men and are far from ideal living conditions for families that include men, women, and children. So, Agriculture forms the economic base of this area, but ironically, California's high cost of living has left agricultural laborers and their families with little recourse. In the Salinas Valley, where most of our community projects take place, lack of housing is a huge issue, both in terms of affordability and availability. 
Uh, the little housing there is is often dilapidated, unsafe, and expensive. And so here you have um, an image of the, the same trailer park that I showed you previous to that. And so in this image, that area in the front there is where this fire here took place. Um, and so this is in King City, the trailer parks in King City. All, all of the tenants are, are, are Mexican. Most of them are undocumented. They live there with their, um, you know, m sometimes multiple families in one trailer. And this was a fire that happened last year uh, where the access from the fire department was really difficult because the, the place is not up to code. Um, and so people actually died in this fire because of, they, were, they were actually warming their house with the stove in order to have heating. Um, and so this is an example of, of the really the horrific uh, living conditions that they have to live in. Uh, so I'm currently organizing meetings with VPA students, tenants, and CCO organizers. This project has not been, with, of course, without challenges. Um, my multiple encounters with the oppressive landlord have been extremely unpleasant, um, but we understand that it's not unusual for landlords and property managers to use intimidation tactics uh, with the tenants or behave aggressively towards faculty and students. So, in closing, the entire situation is beleaguered. Again, the living conditions are extremely bad. The rents are extremely high. The tenants are extremely burdened. However, this, like any worthwhile project, is important. But it does bring up much larger issues of engagement and reciprocity, exploitation, and voyeurism. I manage community projects. I teach ethics and social responsibility, which require constant reassessment of community access and what constitutes change. All this said, I am so fortunate to be here today and to be in dialogue and conversation about the many challenges inherent in teaching community practice, community engagement, social practice, community organizing within the context of this newness that everyone has referred here today as we develop a new language, new methodologies for teaching. So I'm in this for the long haul. So we can talk today or tomorrow or 10 years from now. I'm down. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, next, we have Yao. And he is the colleague of Theaster. So these are, this is Theaster's Pussy. Wailing and working, toiling and failing, wailing and working. I've been working on this field, I've been toiling on this field for a long time. I've been working on this field. I've been praying on this field for a long time. For a long time, yeah. For a long time. For a long time, yeah. Oh, for a long time. Mm -hmm. and working and working and we working and we working and we working and we working and we. Good afternoon. Hey. My name is Yao. Oh, 
Um, everybody has been so awfully uh, thankful to be in this space, to have this microphone and to just talk with you guys and share with you. Um, I'm also very thankful and uh, appreciative of the generosity of good people and bad people and all the people who make this time possible. Um, again, my name is Yao. Um, this thing is always in the way. I always have a thing with microphones. Um, but um, I'm born on Thursday. That's what Yao means um, in the Akan tradition. Akan is the umbrella a tribe for the uh, the tribes that my parents are from. My, my, my dad came to Chicago in 1973. My mom came in 1976. Um, I'm a singer, I'm an actor, I'm a, I'm a dad, I'm a uh, husband. Life moves. Um, and um, I'm currently working on a, a project with um, Mark Bamuti Joseph, um, called Pelota. Um, also, um, I am uh, a member of the Black Monks of Mississippi, the Astor's Baby, child it's growing. Um, and also, um, I do a really um, interesting service uh, I felt for myself a necessary service um, through the Rebuild Foundation um, called Work on the Sabbath. Work on the Sabbath began um, because I was always very, um, words just didn't come when people would ask me, what do I do? What, 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 what type of music? do you like what, what what what's that what style is that and i generally want to tell them leave me alone i don't really want to talk right now i just sang i just gave it i don't want to talk right now but um talking is important communication is important um so i decided to investigate that through um, my dad's taste I, f I, f I figured if i were to kind of understand what my dad liked um, musically, then I might be able to uh, figure out who I was, what it is that I am. So I listened in the listening house um, for about a month to my dad's records. I took my dad's records and I just listened. And um, poems and music came out of that, uh, was inspired from that listening. And then on a Sunday, I would share it with the community uh, in Dorchester. Um, and um, it has grown. It's now a monthly um, process, I would say, um, where we have food and uh, a DJ um, and sharing. Um, so for some time, I had been in the entertainment business. Um, and I realized I don't like entertaining. I like sharing. I like being in spaces where I can receive and exchange and give. Um, so um, that is what work on the Sabbath is for me. It gives myself, it gives a community um, it gives friends and foes and strangers an opportunity to witness sharing. Um, the Esther called me five, six years ago, and he said to me, um, you need to be doing your stuff in places where people appreciate what it is that you do. Audience was the question. It was the conversation. Who are the people you're sharing? Who, uh, who are the people you're giving your stuff to? Um, and I said, cool, yeah, I, I agree. 
But um, I was never really, really thinking about that. You know, so this, this moment gives us all an opportunity to think about things that probably were parts of our bodies that we didn't really move on, you know? So he said, uh, you, you need to be um, performing in these spaces where people really appreciate what it is that you do. And he said, I'm going to help you do that. And for some time now, I've been performing um, in museums and in these cultural institutions where, like paintings, you are um, appreciated. You're valued. It's a thing of a value. You know, you don't want to, I, I, don't, I don't want to anymore um, compete with the clamor of alcohol and uh, somebody's conversation about, you know, baby daddies and, and whatnot. It just interferes with the process. Um, so, uh, I've kind of given like a little summary of, of who I am, but I, I also kind of want to talk about where I'm going. Um, and also uh, to say that uh, I need some help. And it's okay to ask for help. And I don't know what forms of help. I really don't. I just know that help is needed. Um, so I've been also very interested in photography and how photography might serve my music or the other way around. Um, I've also been saying to myself, perhaps I need to abandon music and focus on photography or focus on other voices or um, in a way, and when I say abandon, I don't, I don't mean to totally dismiss the thing that is here, but to just shift the focus, you know? Um, so I, um, I decided to shift the focus back on my dad. My dad has a story when he came to Chicago um, of a time where he almost lost his life. Uh, in that moment, he was at the train station, he was at the subway, and five or six men accosted him, and they were going to throw him on the tracks. And he said to them, Den Namaye. Den Namaye. And they, they stopped. They said sorry, and they ran off. You know? So with that story... What I gathered from that story, a couple of things. One thing that's really actually bothering, that bothers me is that perhaps they did not kill him because he was not an African-American. But the other thing I'm leaning on more is the fact that his language saved his life. His language saved his life. And it made possible, actually this moment that I'm having this conversation with you but it made possible for my sisters to be born it made possible for my mom to for him to ship my bring my mom over to chicago so so forth and so forth but i don't have the language i don't have it he didn't sew it in me you know for reasons that we've kind of talked about since we've been here assimilation and comfort so um when I was thinking about that, I kind of got upset a little bit because I have a really interesting uh, thing with my dad. He, he, he frustrates me. But um, I also um, rather feel uh, this really huge sense of pride and happiness that my father was able to do the thing that he did, not only for himself, but for us. So um, I want to now create um, something of a, a, a video, a photo-based um, story that um, rides adjacent to my dad's being here. So um, I'm going to end with that. It's about a two-minute video, if you guys will um, check that out. But in it, he, my dad is 
um, pouring libation. He is he is thanking the ancestors um, for um, his journey, for the journeys of all of us. And I'll, it's it's in the language in tree. And I just want to translate it before we get into it. <clears throat> Our Father in heaven, here is some drink. The earth on which we stand, this is your drink. Uh, Asunafo, which is our clan, the elders of our clan, um, who lead us with good leadership, gracefully, who we respect. This drink is for you. Kwekudro, Kofi Fofie, Kwami Frempong, Yao Banye, Kwabana Dapa, Ekuya Sewa, Ya Asantua, Ama Binua. We thank you. Take this drink and remember us and support us in everything we do. Any person who has evil intentions, make them suffer on this earth. Thank you. Nanum Kwakudru Kwame Frempong Kofi Fofi Yabani Kwamnanda Pa Ekuya Sewa Yasantua Any Amabinua Yadamase Say ye Namon Kayen Mushrayen Munamunina Yang a cheek Nabribiara aye bayeno, and ye ye na ankosumaye. Ba boni a e kana kona di ma busiyi e ni mbeguasa no mama omre o asasi so ya damase. presenter is Isis Ferguson. Thank you all so much. Uh, my name is Isis Ferguson, and I want to express gratitude. I feel like I'm very, very rarely in a room surrounded by folks where the language of justice and art and liberation is our currency and is our discourse. Um, I very much feel like I'm home, so I just want to thank you all. Um, I'm going to do my best in my 10 minutes to cover the last 10 years of my life. So I'm just going to give you little snippets. Um, I'm going <laughs> to 
I'm going to talk about my 26th year through my 36th year as it relates to learning, creating, organizing, offering narrative, and gathering space in various communities. Notions of place run throughout my story, so it's where I'll begin. I live, work, love, and create in Chicago. As a cultural worker, and now as what Theaster likes to call me, an arts administrator, I am and have always been to a certain degree incredibly concerned with place and belonging. Not because I felt out of place, but I wanted to make place with people. I wanted to claim it. I wanted to imagine better space than is offered to us. Because they do give us space sometimes, but um, it's junky. It's not ideal. So the team that I belong to principally works on the south side of Chicago, a storied part of the city with a rich cultural legacy. Neighborhoods populated by Southerners who uprooted themselves from Mississippi, from Georgia, from Alabama, for the promise of prosperity that an urban industrial life can bring. Generations later, there have been famed residents, people who you all know, who have literally invented the sound styles and art forms that the nation has come to revere. Harlem, since I'm in Chicago, or I'm in New York, I want to say that Harlem has long been lauded as the symbolic capital of black life, life in America. But Chicago is cresting. Chicago has tried to shoot its shot as the soul of urban black America, bringing up the sons and daughters like Gwendolyn Brooks, Quincy Jones, Shaka Khan, Sam Cooke, Tommy Dorsey, Thomas Dorsey, the father of gospel music, and the Johnson publishing empire of Ebony and Jet. And the list goes on and on and on. On the same blocks that have housed these cultural giants, unknown, unsung citizens have worked hard trying to provide for themselves and to mobilize mass political and social movements a progressive change and resistance. And in the past few decades, these same neighborhoods where, where people like Gwendolyn Brooks and Quincy Jones sprung up are the very same blocks that are now garnering the reputations as undesirable, unsafe, lacking investment opportunities, and without a clear path to a viable future. That's the lane I find myself working in, establishing and supporting creative hubs in cities, developing an ethic and a language for those of us who are enthusiastic about cities and see arts and culture as the key animators for transformation. I am not a builder, traditionally speaking. The Astor employs architects and designers for his spaces to physically get the structures built out and renovated. Programmers and administrators, like me, curate experiences for people who visit and populate the sites. I design the social setting that fosters the collective experience. Engagements that get people to leave their own homes and come and share in something public, something that's about an exchange, whether that's about ideas or a performance or even just a hang. I haven't said this term yet because we've all said it's restrictive, but what I'm talking about, in a way, is creative placemaking. It's concerned with the livability of a place. As Carrie Mae said, for some of us, it's a way of life, but it, it has been co-opted and institutionalized. Creating, organizing, narrativizing, if that's a word, and nurturing the cultural ecology of a neighborhood is the most concrete method I know how to employ to impact the quality and the livability of a place. I relish in the collective life and the people who gather in place. I believe that useful, successful places, places I like to call places of purpose, contain at least five attributes. They are, one, sacred spaces, where core ideas about identity and belonging get built. So I call these places of refuge. A time and a location marked by ex exploration, curiosity, investigation, and experimentation. I call these places of discovery where neighborliness becomes an act. Immersive experiences forge deep bonds among participants. 
relational exchange is primary, where individuals get cemented to one another and to the place. I call this a place that affords us the ability to commune, where value systems get articulated and practiced, where we ask big questions about the world and offer innovative solutions and responses, where we listen, where things emerge. For me, this becomes places of inspiration. And finally, there has to be that setting where friction and questioning live, where circumstances require a response or a reframing or a reflection. And for me, these are our places of challenge. I arrived at these ideas out of my own experiences and from the foundational texts in my academic training. This is a little dated. You can tell I went to school in like the late 1990s, early 2000s. <laughs> um, but these books represent the feminist scholars and the theorists who are concerned about gender and race and intersectionality, which for real at a time was um, a truly visionary idea. These works contribute to the formation of my theories of language and justice and equity, ideas that drive all of my work and allow me to offer, as the sister in the front said, skills of code switching and translating across the power fault lines. I translated that training into some essential questions that I always return to in my work. And so I'm just going to read them aloud. Who are your people? What conditions are needed to flourish? What is your purpose? What is possible? In my own life as an organizer, convener, and language provider, I've concentrated on designing community by creating sisterhoods. This manifested itself in a group called the Venus Collective in Chicago. For six years, we hosted Venus the Event, which was a celebration and a showcase of women's art, visual and performing arts, crafts, wares, etc. Women sang, performed spoken word, exhibited photography, sculpture, apparel, painting, and mixed media art. We also did all of the labor. We developed into a community that organized the large creative events that hundreds would attend, but it wouldn't have mattered if only five or six attended. It wasn't about the numbers. And we also gathered so that we could become beyond event friends. We gathered for monthly women's circles, smaller shows that celebrated an individual woman artist and raised money to donate to projects that had progressive gender politics at the center of their mission. There are very few that do. I'm still working to establish sisterhoods. The scale has simply shifted to thinking of cities as sisterhoods. The method has remained the same. Animate place through art and culture. Use a language and a framework of equity and justice. My work simply now lives where Theaster's development work lives. Together with my team at Place Lab, my University of Chicago colleagues at Arts and Public Life, with Theaster's larger crew of makers at the Theastergate studio, or with the other cultural leaders he employs at the Rebuild Foundation, we are becoming a force a collective art practice that is preoccupied with cities and raising questions about making them more equitable and lively places. Each unit of the art practice is trying to accomplish three things in our varied and interrelated projects to, to demonstrate the value and necessity of cities. One, we are trying to unleash, unleash the possibilities of place. We're trying to make platforms, the thing that then makes the thing to demonstrate a process for ethical redevelopment. This is nuanced development, and I think we have feminists to think that tell us time and time again to think and articulate the process and reflect on the process. And then to create places of public assembly. These are the vessels that the Astor talked about. Um, many of you might know the Astor is relentless. This is passion and purpose work for him, and for those of us who manage or are lucky enough to stay. His appetite and the breath of his work is not greed or fueled by a desire for traditional power. 
He is not trying to become the modern land baron of the south side of Chicago, despite what you hear or read. The drive and ambition is fueled by love and held up by grace and by mercy. I put his social responsibility next to other prolific cultural forces like Bell Hooks, Robin D.G. Kelly, and Cornell West sometimes, public intellectuals working and writing to uncover the connection between love and community. I made this postcard for Valentine's Day of all days in 2013 while I was the program coordinator at the Jane Addams Hull House Museum in Chicago. We had staff and visitors send the postcards as notes of gratitude to people who often don't hear any notes of thanks at all, to people designing and impacting the social, political, economic, and artistic life of Chicago. On one side were Robin D.G. Kelly's words. Once we strip radical social movements down to their bare essence and understand the collective desires of people in motion, freedom and love lie at the very heart of the matter. And on the other side, we printed the often trotted out phrase of Cornel West, never forget that justice is what love looks like in public. And after Adaku spoke, I can now add uh, making love visible. I think the Astor's work and my small place within it is heart work. We are like the pads that shock the chest, jolts to enliven for long lasting prosperity. We are pulled by the lore of the local, a book he gave me once, and we are trying to be responsive to and responsible for the places where we are at the current time. So that, that actually does trace my last 10 years of intentional and unintentional creative sharing. I share that with Yao that I'm very much interested, essentially when you boil it all down, I care about um, sharing and gathering. So thank you. Carrie, did you want to say something before we? Oh, I'm sorry, Maria. Yeah. Gaspar. Okay, two brought my timer. Um, so, yeah, thank you for having me, Carrie. Um, and uh, thank you, Rick, for suggesting me today. I had the pleasure of working at PRH or being a resident there this past fall, which is phenomenal. Um, so my name is Maria Gaspar. Um, I'm an artist from Chicago. I grew up on the west side, uh, predominantly Mexican, Mexican uh, immigrant community. West side, Diaster and I are both from the west side. Um, and I'm going to just talk about one project because um, it's uh, because of the limited time and I just really want to focus on one that I think really exemplifies a series of issues that I've been really grappling with for the past few years, not only myself, but a lot of my collaborators. Um, so it's a project that uh, began pretty early on. When I was about 12 years old, I was in Catholic school and in Catholic school in a Mexican-American community. Um, we were taken to the jail, the local jail, as part of a scared straight program. Um, and the idea at the time, a failed program, was to you know, scare kids straight, mostly kids of color. Um, and what I remember the most about my first visit to the jail was not so much um, going through Division I, which is the oldest part of the jail, but um, and seeing mostly black and brown men, people that look like my uncle or my brother or, you know, my friends. Um, but also I was really uh, interested in the way that my teachers, predominantly white teachers, were really scared. <laughs> Um, and there was a very interesting tension that was happening that I was witnessing that I had no idea how to articulate because, of course, I didn't understand the prison industrial complex. Nobody explained that to me. You know, that wasn't something that we were talking about. Um, and so that really stuck in my, in my mind until now and in my heart. So my artistic practice um, is interdisciplinary. It's long engaged issues of displacement, belonging. Um, as uh, Roberto Bedoya talks about disbelonging, um, silencing, and erasure. 
seemingly public spaces that have always been places of contention uh, for me are places that I really grapple with in my work. Um, I was raised through a kind of mural activist uh, history in Chicago. Um, and I was really um, impacted by things like the graffiti blaster uh, a program in Chicago. So this is a program where the city, um, you, you call the city and you tell them that there's graffiti on your garage, the city comes in and blasts it away. But what was interesting is that they would blast it away in brown. Um, and so for me, it was some, there was something about that the act of concealing or, or uh, erasing something was revealing something at the same time. And partly I think it was blasted brown because the aesthetic of the city is brown, you know, a lot of these brown brick uh, architectures, but also as an artist interested in the brown body um, of the immigrant body, that in a way there was a sort of political act. There was an act of browning out, which I was really uh, excited by. But in a way, you know, the city is about, you know, w was, was entrenched in kind of erasing a local narrative. That there are ways that the neighborhood is communicating through, through uh, graffiti, through, through language on walls, that the city would come and completely wipe away. So to me, it was a way of erasing local narratives of local histories, of black, brown stories. So it was about spatial justice. It's about power. So for the past three years, I've been looking at the various ways that the largest architecture of my neighborhood is also the largest single site jail in the country. It's called the Cook County Jail. It's also the location for the yearly Mexican Day Parade. Um, and since I was a kid, the Mexican Day Parade has been setting up floats in front of the jail. Um, and there's a lot of communication that happens between Division I cells and the folks on the ground. So how is the jail negotiated within this community? It's right in the center of a neighborhood. How does the jail um, become visible or invisible um, locally, but also nationally, right? As we think about mass incarceration in this country. So some quick facts. Uh, the jail is located in the Lawndale communities of mostly brown and black, low income and working class communities. There's over 100,000 people detained yearly, about 13, 10 to 13,000 daily. Um, the jail is not a prison, which means that 95% of people are awaiting trial. Sometimes they're awaiting trial up to six years. 85% are charged with nonviolent offenses um, and what the sheriff calls crimes of survival. Um, or most recently, a lack of mental health services due to the decision of a very conservative governor, and I won't go into the long list of educational and uh, service, services that the current mayor has closed in our city. The reality is that mass incarceration, as we know, is a systemic problem based on a lot of racist structures. Um, in 2015, this article came out called Chicago's Million Dollar Blocks, and it was a, you know, a series of research that was done that identified that the jail has uh, a population that are coming from five very specific neighborhoods, all on the south side and all on the west side. Many of these neighborhoods are the same ones that have uh, a lack of employment and social and cultural opportunities, as well as the location of a lot of those CPS closings um, that were uh, done recently. So on the immediate outside, there are 80,000 residents. This is what the jail looks from the administration building. Half are young people. So this is side by side. We got a, a you know, big place of incarceration next to you know, this neighborhood. Um, so we think about the prison industrial complex, all of those layers, but then it's further exceeded by thinking about all the local microeconomies that work around that jail. So we got the taco truck guy that will hold your cell phone or your purse for $2 because there are no lockers in the jail where you can put your stuff in, or the senora down the street who will sell you a white tea for $4 because sometimes women visitors uh, come in with two revealing attire, so they're turned away. So all this, um, so 96 Acres is a project that I started in 2012 with a lot of local collaborators, including a local CDC called Enlace Chicago. Um, it's a series of long-term interventions that are on and around the jail site that include a lot of research, dialogue, organizing, um, and really thinking about how we can further um, uh, talk about all the misperceptions that go along with uh, a place of incarceration, the way it impacts communities of color. 
Um, I work uh, with uh, an extensive group of people. We've created uh, eight site responsive projects, um, personal stories, a sound archive, and we started an education initiative. Again, things that sort of grew out of the process. So 96 Acres is made up of a lot of really radical cultural workers, a dedicated group of educators, healthcare workers, formerly incarcerated youth, artists, journalists, organizers, and many, many others. And a lot of these folks are people that are really rooted in the neighborhood or work in the neighborhood or have some sort of stake in, in the issue. So I'm going to briefly just talk about uh, three different projects. Um, they're all very performative and action-based, so I just had to take a little excerpt from each of the videos. So I'm only going to show you three. Um, but just so you know, um, the work has ranged from collaborating with artists to create zines, um, with, uh, with uh, prison abolitionists, to uh, developing portrait series um, in front of the uh, county courthouse. So here is one that's done by youth, where they generated text and then spray washed it onto the jail wall. Jail throughout the neighborhood. I think it's getting people to think about it, like, uh, the jail's here, it's my backyard, but like, doing this is like, you know, it's starting to get your thoughts like, yo, yeah, why do we have a jail like right here? And, and this community and like, that makes so much money has something like this here, you know? And we don't have a museum. We use the pressure washer in the neighborhood usually to remove graffiti. And this is interesting because this is like reverse graffiti. So I really love this idea to use it to put a positive message just by cleaning. Seeing like, oh, today's your day. It might just change your thought on something that just happened or something like an argument you might have had with a loved one in there. When you look at the jail, you see people, but you don't see them as a person, person. You see them as someone that did something bad, someone that's just bad society and deserve to be the place they are. But sometimes things that people don't really do bad things to be in there. Well, yeah, I have family that's incarcerated, you know? I'm with my, my cousin. So I think that was a really important bit at the end. Sometimes people that end up there didn't do something bad, right? Um, so the next piece that I'll show you is uh, a recent, it was done in August, and it's a series of projections that were projected onto the Cook County Jail wall. Um, you're going to miss the first part of the video, but we collaborated with a group called the Prison and Neighborhood Arts Project that runs a project at Stateville Prison, where most of the men there are serving several life sentences. They created animations, and it was then projected onto the wall. And then you'll hear uh, a teacher, a local teacher, that did a project with her former student whose father had been incarcerated and deported to Mexico. Um, and so you'll see these letters that they're working from to create this animation. So the idea was to represent stories both from the inside and the outside of that wall. This is Melissa Garcia's story, and she's a young woman. Um, she was a student of mine at Wells High School. She had a very difficult life. She, um, her father was incarcerated for at least 10 years. She really knew him for only one year. And when he was released, he was sent to Mexico because he was undocumented. And then um, about a week and a half before her, her high school graduation, her mom OD'd. She was telling me that her aunt had found a box of letters from her father, and she had not known about it. So that's basically what this is. It's her story, but it's told through her father's letters. I feel like it's breathing air into the, the neighborhood, like a side of, it's literally the side of the jail from inside and out, because we're representing the letters Melissa gets from her father and then what he saw in there, and then her reflections about it, and what was happening outside of jail when she was at home with her mom. I happened to be passing by, my daughter was looking at it. She's like, Mom, let's see what it is. So then we started reading it. It, it made me sad because it made me think about my son and his daughter. You know, he made a mistake once, and then he did it twice. So she's little right now, but when she grows up, maybe that's how she's going to feel. A lot of people don't understand it until you're living it, you know? I mean, I never expected my son to be in there. Until it happens to you, then you know how it feels. So these series of interven interventions are meant to create dialogue 
Um, and as you can see, there was a bunch of people sitting on the opposite side of that jail. There's a factory that we've been collaborating with that's been around for 60 years. And at first, when I talked to them and said, we would just like to use your power to do projections, and they looked at my standard projector that I was using from the CDC, and they said, Maria, this is a terrible projector. We really want to help you get a better one. And through that relationship building, they ended up getting us a state-of-the-art, like $50,000 projector, where we were, we were able to properly uh, project these images. Um, and one of the things that the, the uh, owner said is, we don't want to get involved in anything politically. Um, but he just wanted to support. But that was one of the things that emerged, you know, is how do you start these conversations that may not necessarily, they're not necessarily agreeing to something, but they are trying to support a sort of greater vision. And so I kind of like the way that that sort of worked out. Um, and so the last excerpt I'll show is by the Visi Visible Voices Ensemble, which is a group of formerly incarcerated women that collaborated with the Goodman Theater, and their project was called the Visibility Project, stationed right outside of the Visitor Center. Time. I did 13 years of incarceration, so we rooting for them on the outside because everybody needs somebody. When we're behind those walls, we feel like that our voices don't matter and what we have to say doesn't matter. And so Visible Voices, um, when presented to me, was a wonderful idea, a way to, to have an outreach to our community, to our families, to our friends, and to just anybody who just doesn't understand what all this is about. But the idea with the kites was that if people who were out in certain portions of the jail could be able to look up and see that, um, were able to get messaging inside that this was happening so that people knew that there was support out here. My name is Josue Aldana. I'm here to support. So um, what we're asking ourselves right now is how can we reimagine 96 acres? 96 acres is the equivalent of 74 American football fields. But maybe through these projects, we can all collectively think to ourselves what else can take place there. Um, and hopefully that'll create some necessary change. Thank you. I am um, deeply moved by um, so much of what I've, I've heard today. I, I really am. Um, so, uh, and we have only a little bit of time. So um, what I want to do, I want to move this center table out of our way. We're going to uh, somehow make a, a, a lovely larger circle. But I think if we just move this one, I think we might just be OK, right? <clears throat> All right. So come on in, come in with your questions, come in with your comments. We don't have a lot of time, but we've got just enough. Yeah. And, and yeah. Okay. So just move, here. just move. Oh, if we have whiskey. Oh, I'm strong man for. There are um, a number of people in the room that um, haven't spoken from, uh, for instance, from the Asia, the Asia, the Asian Arts Art, Art Center. Um, and so I would like to invite some of those people that haven't spoken this afternoon. Maybe they, they might want to start a little bit of our conversation. We'd love to hear just a little bit about from you. OK? All right. Come on in, guys. Don't be, don't be shy. And um, I'll pass around the mic. So, um, and does somebody want to help me? I think I need like maybe some, just to, somebody else to help me facilitate with uh, passing a mic around. I think we've got two mics maybe. Do we have another one? Okay. Oh, great. Just passing it along. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Oh, great. <coughs>
seeing somebody ask what happens when you fail. So maybe after the Asian heart prevents, we can start with that one. And another one was how do we handle survival? Those were two. I'm, I'm going to, um, I want to, um, before, before we do that, I want to sort of briefly hear from briefly hear from uh, some of our other other guests that haven't had a chance to to speak this afternoon right there are um, and I think that maybe there might be other questions that come up some of these questions that come up of course we won't be able to necessarily answer um, but you know I want before we leave this circle one of the things that I would like to propose is that we do figure out a way I'm hoping that we will convene again. I'm hoping that we'll convene at, uh, in Chicago at Dorchester Project, and I'd like to propose sometime in June, and uh, if that's possible, or maybe at Project Row House. But I think uh, um, Chicago is pretty, <laughs> is pretty central. Chicago is pretty central, so it's easy for a lot of us to get to Chicago, and then maybe we, again we might move it again, maybe in the fall. Maybe, Suzanne, you might have us out in California, right? So, um, so I, I really want to make sure that we um, uh, we have everybody's um, information, everybody's email addresses, and so forth, so that we can continue on. If that is what people really desire, I know that I'm going to be working. I'm Theaster, and I will be doing something. It'd be lovely to have some of you join us. Okay. Um, and then I, I think an, another thing, too, that I want to um, uh, stress before we le leave the circle, because we know that time now is of the essence, is that we have, um, I'm proposing um, a website, that we um, develop a small website that um, pulls together many of the ideas, uh, the presenters and the guests that were here today, and that uh, maybe there might be a small group of you who might be interested in writing, who might be interested in posting, who might be um, interested in helping me to organize pulling that together. So I think that that's another way that we can sort of keep in um, sync and in touch with one another, again, if that is a real desire amongst the group. Yeah? Okay. okay. So from some of our other guests who um, haven't had a chance to, um, to speak today, today, are there like some issues and or concerns, ideas that you'd like to just quickly um, share with us? We have spoken, I'm going to pass it on. <laughs> There's so much to absorb. Thank you. It's been kind of an incredible um, day. And one of the things that keeps resonating for me across many of the uh, uh, talks, but particularly thinking back to uh, something Theaster had brought up, um, if I can find it, um, was the notion of... Uh, Oh, and Adaku too, black space. Um, and it doesn't just have to be black space, but that idea of spaces that are, what is the relevance of spaces that are um, special and restricted with uh, intention in mind and how important that is and what are the conversations that can happen in those spaces that don't happen when spaces are mixed. And I felt like some of that was kind of coming up in smaller ways in um, other, uh, in a lot of the presentations. So that was just something that really has stuck with me. Um, again, um, you know, running, in my particular case, running a POC organization and really being interested and committed and very, um, uh, feel an urgency, particularly in this moment, about building, uh, continuing to build and um, have thriving POC organizations and POC space. Uh, so that's something that's really sticking with me. Um, yeah, the, uh, one of the things that resonated with me in a lot of the conversations um, was also the, the need to uh, uh, archive some of the work that we're doing and archive the stories that we're collecting in the communities. Um, 
because it's not like a, you know like a formal we're not for, uh, there's not there's no formal museums or inst, you know institutions in these spaces where we're working so that is something that you know I've started thinking about in my own work um yeah so that's um for, i guess for me one of the things that resonates um a lot is the question or the <laughs> Um, it's like, what do I do? I didn't <laughs> or the theme um, of of sustainability, um, and I think it's something that I've definitely been um, wrestling a lot with. Anula and I spoke about this on the train, and in kind of processing what it's been like to have Rick working with Asian Arts Initiative over the past couple of years. Really, just thinking about, I think that that there isn't a, that there isn't a single answer, and that there does need to be sort of a spectrum of what constitutes success, um, and that that there can be po uh, projects that are about a singular poetic <laughs> moment that could have many different ripple effects, um, and that there also can be things that, you know, sort of continue on um, for years or decades. Um, and then uh, since my primary role as a sort of cultural worker is also in running an organization, um, for me, I have a question of like sort of how do we, I mean, it's maybe similar to what Kemi was saying, but, you know, sort of how do we build, especially, you know, sort of organizations and institutions of color, um, but to be able to provide kind of the, the framework or um, to be able to be there um, to sort of fill in the gaps like in between the times when we're fortunate enough to be able to have artists partnering and focusing with us on the particular in the particular communities where we live. I am very interested in knowing um, what people want. I'm really interested in this question. You know, like, what do you want from your practice? What do you want, right? And and um, it goes back to something that we've talked about earlier, and it's also something that I know is like one of the most difficult questions to answer, right? I mean, the thing that you know, I'm I'm I am deeply aware of. You know, like I read everything. I really do. I mean, I really look at a lot of stuff. I don't know any of you, right? Essentially, I don't know anything about you. I don't know anything about your work. I don't know anything about your practice. And so you're doing this work, you're doing this work, and you're doing much of this work like in isolation, right? Or under the radar or something, right? So, so I mean, and this is, I mean, do you feel as though the work that you're doing um, is, you of course feel that the work that you're doing is important, but how do we know then about the work? So we know about the Astor's project, we know about Suzanne's projects, we know about Rick's projects. I mean, these, you know, they just had like a fabulous article in the, in the, in, in the New York Times, wonderful, right? You know? And it's beautiful, beautiful. But but there's other work that's being done. So how is this work not being discussed? Why don't we know about this work, right? You're doing all kinds of work. NATO was doing all kinds of work over at Creative Time, right? So there are many, many different kinds of things that are going on. And so in part, that's one of the reasons I'm sort of asking about, well, well what do you want? How do you go about doing it? And then how do we know about it? I mean, we talk about social media as being sort of like panacea, right? You know, that we have like this amazing tool where, you know, all can be known and grasped and understood and put out, you know, that there are all these vehicles and yet most of you are flying under the radar. So this idea about what you want, I think is also connected to, in part, how are you funded? Where's your money coming from? You know, and who is supporting you? So who is supporting your efforts? I mean, you, you kind of arrived at a place that I've, I've been thinking about is, um, well, there's a couple of things. Funding is definitely one of them, but also just a um, kind of like a, a support, a, net, a network of support where you can not only cultivate ideas, but you can um, you can bounce things off of mentors, peers, um, 
you know, space where you can generate. Um, I think a lot of the times why um, um, I've been um, singing, um, a lot of the times why anybody knows me outside of this space is because of theaster, you know, because I've performed, you know, at a Biennale, you know, um, uh, terms that I didn't know before. I knew, you know, so I think a lot of times it, it does take a type of generosity, but but where where is that generosity and where are these clubs? All of, you know. Thank you. Other. Yeah, I'm kind of curious if people need history, if, they, if they're interested in the history. And I ask that, I don't mean that it, ironically, when I started getting involved in this kind of work in the 1980s with people like Lucy Lepard and we created a group called Political Art Documentation Distribution and we began to try to create a network of other practices around the world but around the states and put them in an actual archive, <coughs> which, by, which now is actually in the Museum of Modern Art. Lots of ironies there, but it is there. Um, there was no internet, of course. We tried to create sessions like this, bring people together and have discussions precisely, as Carrie May said, to get to know what each other was doing. And yet, probably very few people here even have ever heard of PAD or know about this archive. And I'm wondering to what extent you really just want to rebuild the wheel over and over again, which is not necessarily always a bad thing. There is that dead weight of history that Marx talked about, which you sometimes have to throw off. So I guess this is one part of the question, and the other part is there's, people have said there's a feeling that something has changed now. There's a sort of shifting up of these activities. And I'm wondering if we could get more concrete about what that feeling actually consists of. I want, I want to speak a little bit, though, about something you said, though, about people working in isolation. And I'm not sure, I mean, I, I understand what you're saying, and that's, that's true in certain instances. But I also, I want to I wanna connect that to your initial question, you know, what do people want? And I, kn I know for myself, and I think many artists this way, you want to make your work, right? You want to be able to do your work. And then the question is, what do you need to do your work, right? So, so for some people, you need visibility to get resources to do the kind of work you want to do. So it becomes a need to be present at, you know, situations like this, or be in the New York Times, or be, you know, these kind of things. If your work, if that's what you need to do the work. But there are many people that are doing their work that are doing their work, and they don't need it. You know, you know I always, I, you know, and I, I bring that to the table from the perspective of one of my mentors, artist named Jesse Lott, who is of the same generation of David Hammonds, who went to school in LA at the same time of David Hammonds. His working, kind of his way of working is very close to it. But Jesse has this notion that he just wants to make his work and share it with people. And he's happy doing it right in Fifth Ward. So he doesn't need, so he didn't, he didn't need to be known by any of us because, it, because being known by us doesn't help him do what it is that he really wants. And I think, so, it's a, so I think we have to really, you know, when you, when you talk about what you want, if, you, if what you want is to make the work, then you have to decide what are the things you have to do to make the work. Are actually really trying to do that in a significant way. Not just own, only doing the work, but they, they're doing the work because they actually want to have impact. That impact is in large social impact. Yeah. Social impact is the only thing that they have. There has to be another level of engagement with the world. And that is what they need. Yeah. I, I, as a whole host of issues, as well as you know, as well as you're trying to figure out how to make it all possible. How to you know, my project is trying to figure out you know how to build a and he's been incarcerated for five years. I'm trying to figure out how to make this live, viable.
And I, I agree with that, but, I, but once again, I'll just say that there are many circles of where that could happen, right? Someone could draw their major support for, for what they do from the public sector, right? I mean, they can be, um, you know, they can have access to the, the political and public sector around them that they won't need the art world, right? They don't need it. So they don't need that recognition. They get the recognition. Then there are some that can do things where they just need the recognition of their community, right? Because they will fuel them, and they will get them the resources to do what it is. So it's just many different ways. And I just want to, I mean, I'm saying that because I just, you know, I think that, you know, as artists, and we, when we connect to the art world, we become the center of the universe in our own minds. Yeah, like, I mean, you know, we become the center of the universe, but there are many other universes out there that people are operating in and doing great work, you know, and the question is, uh, I mean, is to just really know what it is that you're interested in doing and then what you need to get it done, and there are many different ways to do it. But I would, I would agree with you, but I think the thing that is the most problematic for me and that we all struggle with in ways that, in a sense, compromise us and the real work we want to do is how do you make a living while you're doing it? So many of us for years have taught. Those jobs aren't as available as they used to be, but we still teach in essentially full-time jobs in order to go out and do another full-time job afterwards. Or we're lucky enough to participate in the market to a degree that it can bring money in. You go up and down with that. Or you have a job like curation or some related thing. The real issue to me is there's not enough resources to staff those people who really want to do this kind of work. And so I think that we have to explore each of these systems and critique the systems. But what I, a long time ago when I was working in Chicago, somebody, uh, uh, one of the artists came up to me and said, you know, we have a position. If you're working in community, um, you need to be paid for your work. I said, oh, that'd be great. And, and I said, but I, I'm never paid for my work or rarely paid for my work. And they said, well, we don't think you should do the work then. And I just looked at this artist and thought, what planet are you living in on that you think I could not do my work? And the other thing I want to say about the art world is, it provides you with a discourse of peers. If you carefully pick your art world, like Leslie always said to me, I pick my art world. Rick's the art world. Uh, he may not feel it, but he is the art world. Amalia's my art world. Carrie's my art world. We all participate in a discourse that lands halfway between activism and form. Somebody was talking about form. And I think that's a critical issue that is not only about um, doing good for others. I, I have a quick comment. Um, when you asked what, what is it that you want as an artist, my first thought was money. And I'm not talking about funding. I'm not talking about commercialism. I'm talking about income. And this is very much what you're saying as well, where um, you know it, New York keeps going. And now we're starting up in a bubble again, and it keeps going. And there, the stratification and the inequity is through the roof right now. You know, so it's what ends up happening is that artists. It's it's. I actually went to a symposium earlier this year that was talking about um, strategies to stay in New York and have longevity, and they're essentially based in um, assets and buying property. And which is, was a complete moot point to 90% of the people in that room. And I thought the symposium should be about income. It's how can you even begin to entertain having any kind of ownership over your own property to be able to think and do this other kind of work. That is step number one, you know? And it's, it goes so deep that people can't even begin to think on that level. They can't even begin to think, what is it that I want or that I need and how do I get it? Because they are working three jobs. Because they have no time to do anything. They don't have time to go to their friend's opening. They don't have the energy to go to this and that other activity that is meaningful in our own communities. And 
that's the conversation that I want to have. You know, it's like, where is our income as artists and in jobs that are related to art? I teach. I work um, as a studio assistant to an artist. I work in a bar, and I'm an artist. I, Sorry, Hi. Uh, thank you so much. Um, uh, I, I feel like I don't know where to start. I'm, um, I work at El Puente, um, which is a human rights organization based in Williamsburg, Brooklyn. I was here with my uh, boss, Francis Lucero, executive director. Um, I just, I am just so blown away by this whole event today. I'm so grateful to have um, and heard from all the panelists, all the speakers, this discussion, um, and. When you ask that question, what do we need? What do we want? You know, for me, I, what the sister just said about income that was like right on the money, um, just to be able to live, like not even not not even thinking in terms of making money, but just like living, right? Like making a living. Um, but what what I want and what I need, my work is with undocumented immigrants. I I, I wrote a, a play uh, based on my interviews with undocumented immigrants from Latin America. We're at the Fringe Festival. We've we had a lot of interest and um, a lot of success with the play. But, but what, what I need is allies and a team. And what we're doing here today, like 10 times a year, five times a year, you know, like I can't tell you how incredibly helpful is for me just to meet other artists and um, to ask each other the questions and to, to learn from each other. But to like a mentor, uh, a team of people that are that understand me and my project and what I'm trying to do, people who can help me put the pieces together, like the public sector, the community sector, the art sector, like how do I put all of that together? Like I know I'm an ESL teacher, I, I teach English to undocumented immigrants and that's one part and then I'm an artist, I write plays, I act, I, how do I put all the pieces together? I, I'm, you know, involved in the immigrant rights movement, I'm going to rallies and, you know, protests all the time, protesting Trump and all this, how do I put that all together? Like a team, like where's my team of allies who can meet like a smaller group, something like this on a regular basis, maybe once a month who can help me put all of that together into some kind of roadmap or some kind of strategic plan to just create a piece of art that speaks to um, you know, the rights of undocumented immigrants and, and what we have in common with them. When, when people, I remember when my art career was starting to grow, I met these couple people who we would call like famous art people. And if, if you took the fame away, what I found was that they were, they were actually asking me these very key questions. And one of the questions was, so who's on your team, right? And so what, what they meant by team was, Who's gonna, who knows everything about your work so that you could call on them for in a dime, on a dime, and they could write about the work? What, what curators do you know? What, what healers do you know? Like who's, who's loving you? Who's in your corner loving you? And I think that sometimes we think the only way to do that is through a formal organization. That, that you would actually create a board for a not-for-profit that would do all of the things that you actually need as an individual. And so maybe one way of thinking about this is like, who's my board? Who can I call on that would act as a kind of partner in my life that's like maybe ahead of me, th there's my phrase again, ahead of me and I could call them the same way I might a board and say, look, I just need to be able to talk to you three times a year. Would you be willing to meet with me for a coffee and, and, and I'm gonna download some things, right? Like Rick did that for me. Carrie Mae, when she came to Chicago, we hadn't met before. And she was like, oh, okay. 
I'm going to call you tomorrow. And she called me. And it was like this, this. And so I think that some of the luxury that people, what, what looks like success is that these people are kind of ensuring a certain amount of survival by creating the, the team that they need around them. And I think that that's actually something that we can do with more um, consciousness, yeah, and, and more agency. And it doesn't actually take a grant to do that. It takes a willingness to be humble and ask people that you really believe in to be supportive of the work you do. So I just had a quick comment. Um, I'm here as a practitioner, uh, but I'm also here with um, as as a board member. I sit on a board of a foundation that gives money to painters and sculptors, and it has been giving money to artists for 20 years. Um, and it's only this year that this foundation is suddenly starting to talk about socially engaged art. And I really feel this, that the question about what, what do artists who do socially engaged art want is a really important one. I can't underscore how important it is to communicate to foundations what you need and what socially engaged art is. Because I have a feeling that a lot of foundations don't have a clue. I mean, there are a handful of foundations that are, <coughs> I think, jumping on a kind of bandwagon um, and supporting the work, and, and it's great that they are, but um, I really don't think foundations know how, how to gauge a success of a, of a project. I mean, I think they're still measuring success through demographics, you know, just the old sort of old ways, old models, old tools. They don't understand that you may need money for planning, for outreach, and you may, you may need multi-year funding. Um, you certainly have to build in failure to your projects to learn from it. So, I mean, I, I think that as a network, we really have to advocate for this kind of work. And we have to explain to the people that we are asking money from what how they can truly support us in really meaningful um, and, and deep ways. I just want to respond to that. Yeah. <laughs> I just want to make one, I just want to throw this out for you as a, on the board of a funding entity or any other funders or whatever, and for the artists too, is to just know that we've, Artists have generated this whole consciousness about social and community engaged work, but there's it's been forced into this thing of outcome, <laughs> which is shifting all the resources to developers, right? Whether developers are are in, you know institutions and so on and so forth. So all that money, I mean that you know we're generating all this energy around social and community engaged work. Artists are doing that, but not very many artists are getting the money. So that's part of our money. That's part of the problem is going somewhere else. <clears throat> um, so one of the things we do at the Creative Time Summit is not only, I'm just thinking about power and famous artists versus not famous artists. And I think we're in a historical shift um, where this kind of work is only going to grow, but the opportunities are going to stay about the same amount of numbers. And in fact, when we talk about faculty, it's far less, and that's going to stay the same. Which is to say that there's a different kind of thing when you can be famous from your art versus not going to be, which is to say make a living versus not. And I think that, you know, in some ways for those that aren't going to make a living off this art, which we'll call the multitude, uh, there's different ways of thinking about art. And, um, and that kind of complexity of publics and working across networks is to some degree liberating because you don't have to worry about that authorship thing. Um, and you can do coalition building. But I do think we need to stare income inequity in the face and realize that a large majority of the people doing this work are not going to get paid, and there is a real class war happening in this country. And so what are the models of working that refuse authorship, that aren't going to make a dime out of the art world, but want to build networks in a condition of resistance? You know, that's because it's a very different thing than someone that's making a dime out of the art system, which for those of us that can, Hold on tight and don't let it go. But it's hard to say to young people, like, hey, look at me. You can do this too. And they're just like, I hope you're right, but I don't think you are. 
You know, I, I just don't think the math is going to hold up in the next 20 years. And it's true, it won't. So what do we do about that? And I think just in terms of our own communities, being clear about the economic realities and wh how that shifts our kind of institution building and infrastructures is, is a dire need, a real dire need. It's interesting. I was going to make a different comment, but I want to respond to that. Um, I'm, I'm an artist who makes my living as an urban planner. Um, and, you know, one of the things, I, I work for the city. One of the things about being an artist, I was telling some folks this earlier, when you're an artist who works for the city, all of the other artists who work for the city come and find you and they say, I do this too. Um, and so I, I, there is something that's happening and it's not recognized and I'm not sure if that's important or not. But for me, being an artist in that space gives me a certain kind of leverage that I wouldn't have if I was an urban planner working as an urban planner. Um, so as an artist who works as an urban planner here in New York, um, I'm, I'm working on a lot of kind of large scale neighborhood change right now. And so many of the things that folks have brought up in this room today about this real craving to know and to be known are things that people in communities are saying too. You know, there's this sense that once upon a time, we knew, like we knew what was going on. We knew who was down the block. We knew, we had this inherent sense. Nobody can quite articulate how we knew, but we knew and we want to know again, but we don't know how. So that's, that's what I wanna know. <laughs> how do we do that? How do we, how do we, how do we come to know again? Um, I have two comments. One, um, early on in the day, um, Suzanne was saying that um, she was concerned about the young and not knowing community organizing, and it's really, really interesting. So I, um, I work at an organization called Apple Shop that's in a town of 2,000 people, and it's been there for 47 years, and I, like, in my head, like, I don't know anybody in my crew of people that are young in my region who don't understand community organizing as the base of everything, right? Because there's no other way work gets done in rural communities. Um, you have to work every avenue you have because there aren't many avenues to explore or capital to be had. You know, you have to, um, like, for instance, I was also thinking a lot, Rick, of what you were saying around time, right? Like, if I think about what I need or what Apple Shop needs or what my region needs, it needs sustained time to create a different future. That's what it needs. And it doesn't, and a lot of the time, we have to, how we get that time is we come and make connections with other people, other communities that are dealing with similar things because we know we're not going to get anywhere unless other people get places, right? Nobody's free until everyone's free. Um, and yet that takes time away from place-based or community people-based work. Um, and so I think that I, I don't, I don't really know how to solve it, but what I think is true is that, for instance, I thought it was interesting, Rick, when you were saying it's taken 20 years to see certain outcomes from the row houses, right? That when when you are doing that type of long haul work with people or in a specific place, having the time to literally just build and try again and fail and redo, it just it, it takes a while. <laughs> and I think like we're always in this hesitancy to like do, 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 prove, 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 like be huge, show what we can do, da, da, da. Like, yes. And like, sometimes I think like we really just have to make sure that um, we are taking risk and opportunity when we can. And yet also recognizing that there are, um, there are certain p people within, say, the arts field that are able to move quicker because of their access to certain capital um, institutions or um, the fact that there are even public art jobs. Like, that doesn't exist where I live. You know, like, anyway, I'm just saying, I think that um, if we're, as a country or as a society, going to get to a place where we understand community-engaged art in a way that creates the societal change we want to, we need to understand the different paces that this is all happening in and figure out how to support one another and kind of be generous, reach out to, pass the baton to places that we see actually um, needing a little more <laughs> to get going. You know what I'm saying? Um, I mean, I think all yeah. the people here are doing Absolutely. that, and I really appreciate it. But let me uh, let me no. just say that, that. Let me just say just one quick correction. <laughs> I meant artists. 
young people. I didn't mean all young people. I worked in mm -hmm. with Apple Shop for five years. I know it well. But I think we're not teaching young people community organizing in art school settings. Yeah. Are you next? Okay. I'll I just want to <laughs> say that I feel that so much and I'm glad that you spoke because one thing that was kind of in the back of my head was as I was watching the presentations is I was like this is these practices are for the most part rooted in urban city centers or you know cities with international connections <laughs> um, and that's actually not a context that I'm working within in Dallas, um, even though it is urban, but it doesn't have that international cachet, or that, for example, Appa Shop is working in, in the South, and I think that the challenges are really different, um, and the ability to form networks and to have supportive allies are really different, too. So sometimes I'm like, all I want is for all of you guys to move down to Texas, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so that I don't have to count the number of socially engaged people on one hand, right? But I think what I want on a larger level is how do we think about these practices, which are supposedly rooted in a place, not just as practices that are actually in really migratory urban international centers, but as practices that are actually in suburban or in rural places where people don't leave for 20 or 30 years. So like those are my two desires. Great. Um, so I wanted to shout out the resource generation for a moment as a potential strategy offer. Um, for those who don't know, resource generation is an organization um, that encompasses people with wealth, and they intentionally give money to a number of different spaces. And last year, they made a commitment to give $1.4 million to black-led organizations, and they were able to fund 100 black-led organizations across the country. And that was a very specific commitment um, that was definitely ushered by a lot of black activists from across the country. And I think there's an opportunity to do that here. I don't think we're here at Ford Foundation that obviously has a lot of access to a number of different kinds of resources. Um, but what would it look like to bring different foundations and folks who have money together to one, educate, um, to expand the definitions of what socially engaged art. So it includes our stories, um, and then to start to redirect the streams of money intentionally into the work that we're doing. And also there's a lot of folks in this room that are doing incredibly powerful, impactful work that also need a number of resources. And so I'm curious for the folks who have a lot of privilege, <laughs> um, what it would look like to, to utilize that access to bring funders together and to bring folks who have a lot of access and ask the question, can you make the commitment for a year, for five years, for 10 years, to give this amount of money specifically to this kind of socially engaged work that is specifically funding, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna say it to folks of color's work across the country, and I think it would make a significant shift, honestly. Um, yeah, I, the, the uh, piece from what you shared, what the folks were on the, were, um, graffitiing on the, on the floor, what is your responsibilities? I think a question that we all have to ask ourselves is with the power and privileges that we have, what are we gonna do with it? Uh, yeah, just like to make a thought. You know, I think, I think as members of our creative field, we're, we're in a very special time of, of uh, self-definement. You know, I mean, I think, I think that we could build coalitions that, that, that could really create what we're looking for, but it, it, it's, it's kind of within us to, to be the glue to allow that to happen. You know, I, I, I really like uh, ideas of self-dependency and uh, autonomy and really initiating the resources that you're looking for yourself. You know, that, that could be seemingly very difficult, but I think through a, a, a creative entrepreneurial mind, and the right networking is like, I don't, know, I don't know if I'm gonna see anybody in this room ever again. I don't know if I'm ever gonna hear from anybody in this room ever again. But there's so much potential here that, to, that, that we could, just with this, this little circle, never mind the, the extensions of it, that we could, we could almost achieve anything that, that, that we would want to. 
you know, it, it was really great to go uh, in Pittsburgh and meet uh, or hear from the guy from Conflict Kitchen, who, as a Jewish man, ha had all this this hate coming from him because he he, he was representing the, uh, the 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 culture that is the supposed enemy of, of of the Jewish state. Now, as a Jewish man, he was called anti-Semitic. He was called all this. We're gonna his funders pulled the funding from him. He said, "Hey, you represent anti-Semitic, you know." And but at that point, in Conflict Kitchen, he had already become so successful. He was like, "Hey." I don't need your funding because we're able to self-fund ourselves, you know. So I'm interested in how we can kind of coalition and build to where we want to be, but not have to always walk around with our hand out, you know. That's just a thought. I'm taking the mic. I think um, Lonnie wanted to say something, Lonnie Graham. Thank you. And then um, um, Amaya. Because I've been, I've been really good. <laughs> it was really us, good. You let the younger artists speak, you know, so I'm like holding with someone like, wait a minute, wait a minute. Wait a minute. <laughs> okay, go ahead, Lonnie. Thanks. There's, within the context of the conversation, there are a number of key issues that all, that all of these things go back to. One has to do with some level of repository or a place of reference where all of our work can be referred to and be documented in a substantial and, in a substantial and <coughs> So that people understand that what we do has, has and retains value. Then that goes back to another really important and essential we have to keep the value of we know that we know that what we do has value is valuable and a great part of how we exist and how we exist in society can exist without the contribution of the artist and of, and of art so in order to become successful broader perception of We all know how valuable we are. Right? We can do all of that. But until what happens in this, in this culture and society at large reinforces that until it goes back to another level of facilitation that someone referred to earlier. We, we really can't move ahead in a substantive way without some level of really serious commitment. There's no reason on earth <coughs> that any one of us should be prevented from doing what we love to do, what we were born to do, without some level of support. It has to be acknowledged. There have to be people in places that know and understand and acknowledge what we do and who we are as artists, acknowledge the contribution of what we do in a substantive way. I guess I'm talking about, I guess I'm talking about money. What do you do? You're a bartender, you're a teacher, and you're an artist last. I'm sorry. You're an artist first. And then you do all of those other things. I'm an artist first. I'm sorry. <coughs> I can't help it. I was born that way. It was something that I understood when I was very young. Why does that have to be a stigma in this society and in this culture? Why are we marginalized as artists? There's the question. That's the thing that needs to be answered by the society at large. There's the infrastructure that needs to be established in order to support our efforts. Not only, and here we are, working really hard with society, with culture, with people, on a really grassroots level. Who supports you? You go out there and you tell them who you are and what you do, and they support you. They are there. What about, what about all those other people with the means to support you, the way that you need to be supported to go and do the project 
that you've already built the foundation. You understand what I'm talking about? You understand what I mean? Oh, yes. You know who those people are. They know who they are, too. And those are the people that need to be invited into the room. Those are the people that need to be invited into this conversation. You asking me what I need? That's what I need. I need for those people to be in the room when I'm talking, when you're talking. I need for those people to be able to share in this conversation. That's what I need. Thank you. I'll okay. Um, Amaya, um, Amaya first, and um, you've been waiting to, to go also. Uh, Amaya, and then, sorry, Bayate. Bayate. Well, I think we've been talking about, you know, big goals, um, larger uh, issues of the appropriate remuneration, the support, the structural changes. We've been fighting that same battle for a long, long time, and we'll be doing it longer. But I feel like we're present in this room today, and we've been listening to each other, and there have been people talking about everything from healing to violence against women to following the heritage of their father to the idea of larger global structures of organization to very rooted, localized issues about why is a giant jail in the middle of a Latino community. And I think if we've been listening to each other, some of you know somebody already, or you found somebody maybe in this day that you're interested in knowing more. So I think that one of our more short-term goals <coughs> using both of the information on the network that's in the last page of the handout, as well as the potential website, is to start to see if we can't build some, maybe begins either in regional, because it's easier to find each other and get to each other. It might be like-minded issues and themes, feminism, sexuality, housing, healing. Somehow it feels to me as though we shouldn't really leave today without beginning to establish some of those smaller alliances, um, coalitions, and support networks. Because in the short term, that at least opens the door for um, people to have uh, the board, so to speak, the team. And, I, and you know, that whole big discussion about whether the art world knows you or doesn't know you, you know, whether you're under the radar or above the radar, and some of us who've been in it a long time were under the radar, over the radar, behind the radar. They found us, they lost us, we, we got rediscovered again. We may never get rediscovered again. We had our 15 minutes and then maybe that was all there ever was. So I feel like, just speaking for myself, um, chasing that thing, the art world, which we now know is composed of uh, hedge funds. Uh, uh, first it was biennials, now it's art fairs. Um, the auction houses, y you know what I am talking about. It's, it's just money, money, money at the deepest, purest level of greed and investment. So we could still keep chasing that and maybe someday there will be an initiative that will help some of you to balance out your living. But in the in-between time, I think the one thing you have is your passion and your passion that's shared with other people. And so if we could at least begin today to maybe decide a next convening, begin to maybe see who identifies with each other in either rural or smaller gatherings or um, like-minded practices. Because when I was listening, I mean, the practices are wide ranging. I mean, they're some of them really deep social practices. Some of them are led by a, really almost a fine arts thinking. Others are led by community consortiums with long histories. So none of us do the same kind of work, but some of you have affiliations with each other that could help to create maybe some informal alliances. I'm not talking about a giant network and we all get a badge or pay dues. I mean, we tried that and that doesn't work. Okay. <laughs> you don't know how many I belong to. But I just feel like this is such a great moment to listen to all of you and see what the future looks like. And I guess the question is, what do you need? But the other question is, what do you have? What do you have right now in your work, in your relationships, and in this room? Because I think 
that that's where you start with what you have. Um, so I want to, there's a couple of things I just want to summarize really quick. I think one thing that's important for us as artists, um, in this time is to really be willing and able to redefine how we think of ourselves and what we think of our skill set as being. And I think we all have a very, um, distinct and multifaceted area of expertise and it transcends different mediums, right? So while I was trained as a photojournalist and I've become a fine artist and multimedia artist, what I actually, some of the things that I actually know, because I know a lot actually at this point, um, but some of the things I actually know in terms of skills are, I understand storytelling. I understand visual literacy. I understand how to imagine something, go through the process of researching it, and then figure out how to make that thing I imagined a real thing. And I think, you know, I could go on and on, but there's all these different skill sets we've learned by being creative people that actually transcend a specific discipline or a specific practice. And I think it's important for us to think of ourselves as people with this area of expertise um, because the expertise of imagining something and then figuring out how to create it, that's going to the wayside. I teach college and I have so many who come into and to the classes and they only know how to be given instructions and follow them and they think they should get an A. They don't know how to think critically and figure out, no, it's a serious problem. They don't understand how to take information process it and then utilize it for one scenario versus another scenario and figure out how it fits their benefit in those different scenarios. And that's something that we have that's extraordinarily valuable. I also think um, it helps us to look at what we do as a public service as well and to think about our idea first in terms of our work, but then also think about how many different ways that idea can manifest. So I've been doing some work lately with transmedia, which is basically art and media that can exist on multiple platforms. Um, and one of my colleagues once compared it to a toy I used to play with when I was a kid uh, called Transformers, but you could apply it to anything that's like a comic book story. Whereas this is something that is an idea, that's a core idea that can manifest itself many ways. It could be a comic book, it could be a movie, it could be a toy, it could be a coloring book, um, it can be a narrative story. So how can our ideas and our interests translate as physical sculptures, as experiences, as paintings, as drawings in all these different multifaceted ways so that we can always find which audience can be engaged through which path? I think those are some really important things for us to think about that allows us to take back a lot of our power instead of, as someone else mentioned, just having our hand out so often. Um, I was really interested in returning to the conversation around failure because I feel like what I need most is a safe space to fail. And I feel like so many... Uh, grants and so many fellowships and so many residencies are so product oriented that you actually don't get the time to think and process information. And so you're constantly driven towards making a product so you can fulfill your grant requirements so that you can get funding again, that you don't really get the time to think. And so I think, and I don't, I don't want to say more than money, but at the same level as, as we want money, I also just need time to think and to process. And so today was really overwhelming for me because my brain goes very fast, but I'm also trying to process all these thoughts that are happening and trying to digest and having to check out of the conversation so I can digest what I just heard so I can re-enter the conversation. And so, so often we don't even, like, we're going to all leave and we're not, we don't really have time to sort of download and decompress and really think about everything that we've heard. And so I don't really need time to, like, make more art, but I really need time just to think and to think publicly. And then for someone to tell me that line of thinking doesn't make any sense and to be told that and to get that critical feedback so that my practice grows. So I think I end up in a very reflexive um, art making practice where I keep doing things the way that I know how to do them because I don't have time to think about other ways to do them because I'm constantly worried about making a product so I can get funding for the next round so that I can do this whole process again. So when do we actually have time as artists to sit and think without any pressure of having to present an artifact that we thought and made something? And that's what's been really frustrating for me as an artist. Um, I think one of the wonderful things about this is it, it feels suddenly like a level playing field. feels like no matter what the status of, of our um, careers or projects, you, we're all like facing so many of the same issues 
and uh, challenges. Um, I, I wanted to just get back, I think, uh, to what you said, Lani and Amalia, and a long time ago, Carrie, that you said um, you need to know what to ask for and you need to know how to ask for it. And it seems to me here that everybody knows what to ask for. I mean, this has been an incredibly articulate uh, event. Um, there's no doubt that you all, we all, I know what we need to ask for. Um, I just spent the last six years in Denver running a, a small nonprofit photography organization. Um, my aim was to build community and to build up the community for contemporary photographers and contemporary photography, which in Denver was very much the C word. Um, there was a lot of, of pushback from that. I gave myself a timeline of um, three years before funders would, would be receptive and be coming to the table. Six years it took and they were still not ready to commit. It's like it's hard to believe that, you know, as an old white guy, I hit the glass ceiling there and, and it was really frustrating. I realized I didn't know how to ask for what I needed. I didn't know particularly how to ask for money. And I think asking for money is the most difficult thing that I, as, as, a, as a, an administrator, um, as a director, have had to deal with. You know, personally, I would like to learn how to ask for money. I'm, I'm betting here that most people sort of have that challenge as well. Um, just to bring up your question, I'm sorry, about um, a circle of support or your own board in some ways. Uh, one thing that was very successful in Denver was run by one photographer who was kind of like a, a maven in the Malcolm Gladwell sense. And um, he used his network. Um, he Every two years ran uh, Photography Denver, which grew from a very small event to involving about 160 galleries. It was very informal. How he did it was just contact all his friends, meet in his garden, meet in his house, and and contact the people that you know that are on your same wavelength. And, and I think that just doing it in a grassroots way um, is nine times out of 10 going to work. I certainly wouldn't rely on an institution um, to do it for me, um, having been at one. But anyway, um, I, I'm starting to ramble, but I, but I, but I do think kind of the things, as you said, Carrie, n knowing what it is and knowing how to ask for it is so critical. And I, I come out of this event here um, uh, feeling really inspired um, to learn how to do that. Yeah. Hi. Uh, thank you all for having having me, and it's been it's been great. My name is Alex. I'm from Apple Shop in Kentucky, um, and uh, I, I I have agreed with very very much of what's been said here today. But there's two particular things I take issue with, um, and I want to challenge. Um, <clears throat> one one was this idea of publicity, right? Publicity. Uh, whether you had heard of our organizations as a measure of success. No, 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 no. I don't. I don't mean. I don't. I'm not trying to rephrase. W would you? Yeah. Well. And I, fr I phrased it poorly. I didn't mean to straw man uh, your, your point. Um, what I mean to say is just that in the case of some organizations like Apple Shop, that's an incredible challenge. Um, for 50 years, that's what we've been trying to do, is to make areas like New York aware of us because we're invisible, right? We're one of the few, I I've traveled a lot of places, right? Um, I've been a lot of places. And Native American reservations and Appalachia, in my opinion, are the two hardest places to live in America in terms of social services, life expectancy, drug abuse, uh, law enforcement, 
uh, political corruption down the gamut. It's irrelevant to most of America that that happens in Appalachia. They don't care. It's one of the few places that can be openly ridiculed on almost any medium, a uh, redneck, a hillbilly. It's so poorly understood, issues like guns are just, uh, you know, guns are important to rural people, but it's laughed out of a conversation amongst, I'm, I count myself very liberal, but I'm also Southern, and that shapes my view of issues like the Confederate flag, because I would seriously doubt, I grew up in Jackson County, Eastern Kentucky, as the only black person in an aggressively racist county, that I've been called the N-word, I've fought more on the basis of race than probably anybody in this room, right? It, it was my name. Yet I can distinguish between a Confederate flag and racism, because I care about the distinction. But it's easy to wipe away a whole bunch of people as bigoted or whatever, uh, ignorant, and then forget about their concerns. And I think that's a lot of what Apple Shop has had to deal with, is expressing the fact that, one, we're not all toothless and ignorant and, stu you know, and racist, and then, and, then to, and, then, and then the other part of Apple is we're the only one doing it. So if we're not heard of, then, it, then it's, it's even a further sort of uh, amplification of the need uh, for this part of the, uh, of the American experience to not be ignored. Nevertheless, it is. Um, and that's a struggle. And, and we have a marketing department. And we have 100 documentary films. We've been around for 50 years. We have a radio station that's been broadcasting for 35 years. We put out media to be heard. Yet... Ada's picture was on the front of an Atlantic article four months ago. I don't know how many people read it, but would people have read it? Would you, would you have picked up that article if the subject matter is rural America? Um, a lot of us read this other New York Times article, but I'm curious if the Atlantic article would have gotten as much play. And I just have to say, uh, that was the best presentation I've ever seen. <laughs> uh, Lester, uh, you shook me. Uh, to my core with many things that you said. Um, but I do want to disagree with one. But please, uh, don't ignore the fact that everything else you said I agree with. But it was about the consequences, the ripple effects of something like a cafe. You know from the black experience, and I'll and I sort of echo that too from the rural experience, that one concern I have about that, about not having a sustainability plan, right? Any, any event has consequences. Right? Anything that we do will have ripple effects. So that can't be the goal in and of itself, in my mind. It would be to try and predict. Now, this is an impossible task. Nevertheless, this is the human goal, is to try and predict consequences from a set of actions. Right? I'm not going to eat if I didn't think it would satiate me. But I'm trying to predict the outcome. It could be that I eat and I'm poisoned. Art, on the other hand, can be created for the sake of itself. Art, like... Uh, in my opinion, unlike a cafe, art can be created because the artist wants to create it. Now, there's a lot of restaurateurs that create the restaurants that they want to create, which is why restaurants are the least successful business in America, right? And then, and so the ripple effects, now I, I'll go back to this rural and black, you know it's a common refrain in the black community, that if you give something new and different and it doesn't work, at least black people think that the impression will be that's not, we're not going to get that again, right? They tried it. They messed it up. Same thing's true in rural communities where we're trying to start a tech company. If that fails, it has to fail for the right reasons. Otherwise, the ripple effects will not be positive. It'll be an affirmation of previously held suspicions. So that's, that's my one criticism, is just that I think creating a cafe for the sake of a cafe, uh, it's a completely unpredictable consequence. It's not that the ripple effects will be positive, which I think was the insinuation. Who knows what they'll be? It may be that no restaurants will open up in this area because look, this one had so much support and still it failed. So maybe, maybe, maybe we can, I'll start there and try to also respond to the question of failure. I, I think I should first say, uh, I should make an admission that um, there have, been, there have been times in my artistic practice where I stopped making so that I could work two day jobs, so that I could save money, so that when I go back to my artistic practice, I could have the kind of autonomy and uh, discretion to, like, in, in a way, art, art was seasonal. Art, art, art making, it wasn't like I do, it wasn't like, I have to do this every day or I'll die. It was like, there's a thing I want to do, and no one's interested. 
So I'm going to work for two years to do the thing that I want to do, and then I'm going to do it. And that there was, there was a kind of willingness to make some sacrifices in order to realize this thing that I wanted to see. I rarely hear or see artists talking about the sacrifices necessary to make the work that they want to make ultimately happen. So to, if, whether it's a, a place to stay or a, a city to live in or a, that in a way we believe that we should be able to carry our artistic practice forward all the time and, sac and, and there is no sacrifice in, in a way. Like, like we're artists, we should be able to make. And I, I haven't found that to be true for myself. So part of the admission would be I have to accept in my, in, my, in my way of knowing the world that sometimes even when I try to do a thing successfully, a system might keep it from, from being successful. It, a, a system might work against me toward its failure. I think so. so even in my great black optimism, I know that there's the potential for, for failure. So I've kind of incorporated that. I've, I've said to myself, all right, I conned myself, I tricked myself out. Like, okay, this could really not work. But I'm, I'm super committed to this thing. The admission is I actually love business. I love business, business, like really, like I love doing deals. I'm really organized. I love leading people. And that there are all these skills that, I, that, that we never talk about. This is back to your point. There are these other complementary skills that are absolutely crucial to a certain kind of survival. But we never, we never talk about those skills that are absolutely necessary in this world, in this world, in this world today, a certain set of skills are imperative. And those skills are not being taught to us in eighth grade, in third grade, in our MFA programs, that the only people that are actually getting it are neurosurgeons who are doing research in labs in a system that will work, or, um, or I talk about this all the time, MBAs who are being taught, if you try to make a deal and, and they say no, you shake it off, you go back, you meditate to yourself, brother, and you say tomorrow, I'm gonna sell that car. Right? And it's like all of the spiritual and motivational teaching is being taught in the motherfucking MBA program. And it's like, well, how did they co-opt uh, uh, faith. How did they co-opt hope? But in fact, the cats who are most interested in this world system working understand that the things that artists used to know are the things that would make this world work. And artists are now chasing rubrics. Now the reason why we got to move so fast and work so hard to try to make the thing right is because we, cause we know that if it's being judged by portfolio manager that they're going to look at the thing they're going to think about outcomes and so one of the things that you can do Carrie May is talk with our programmatic our, our officer leadership and say as we're developing this thing that we call social practice uh, these are some things that we found that that in fact it's not a one-year project that we that will yield a certain kind of success it's a relational uh, uh, process and that in some cases the only times that we'll see market success of a certain kind is over 10 years right which means that we have to be committed to a way of living with an artist or a way of uh, or uh, the health of a community over a long period of time and we're gonna be committed with you as you figure these things out I have another admission um, the, the second the second admission has to do again with maybe with school or with learning. Somebody mentioned learning over here. But there's a way, that, like, uh, the thing that I talk with Yao about the most is not about how do you game the system or whatever. It's like, are you willing to ask the hard questions to yourself about whatever is next? So I may not have the luxury of a mentor, but there's a set of things that I really want to learn. And so I read the biographies of artists because I think that those biographies help to answer a certain set of questions that I would, I would also want to ask Rick. 
So when I think about Joseph Boys, now that we're in this conversation of like social sculpture, I recognize that, oh, actually Joseph Boys isn't my guy. He was more like the proponent of an idea that he didn't practice. I'm actually interested in certain, but I would only know that about Joseph Boys if I actually was willing to read the 48 books about Joseph Boys, right? And that Joseph Boys wanted to be loved more, more than he wanted to be a, 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 a badass ch change agent. I have my thoughts about this thing. So it's like, oh wow, I'm actually more interested in uh, people who know how to do small scale development and combining them with people who do faith work and combining them with people who are interested in this pedagogy, pedagogy of, of the oppressed. And it's like, how do you start to carve out by asking questions of yourself and of the things that are in the world that are available to us for free, how do you start to carve out something that looks like school? The MFA by itself will not give you what you need to be a successful artist. The MBA by itself, a degree in theology, a degree at all, school probably won't teach you how to learn. And so how do we then grapple with those truths that, um, that I actually knew that the cafe wouldn't fail. Uh, I knew that I don't own the building. I knew that if the university, like if whatever, that there was a way in which by making the gesture so big that there would be people around me that would hold it up. And that if I was a failure as a potential restaurateur, that there would be another person that would be like, oh, I actually know how to make restaurants. But the, all the people I know who know how to cook, who know how to manage, don't have the money to build the thing. So what I was interested in was just kind of really occupying the space so that the, the demonstration of the thing could be evident and then people who actually know how to do the thing could get in. Right, so I appreciate it. So the advantage of sitting next to Theaster is you know he's gonna end up with the mic at some point and you can grab it. I just have a quick, <laughs> I have a quick um, comment about history. We've talked about it repeatedly and I think the whole event was set up <clears throat> really in terms of history. How many of you here know know what Apple's shop is? Raise your hand. And Dudley Cock. And okay, but this is really, this is important. This is important because it's about, like I worked for Apple shop for five years. It's about the networks that we formed in the late 60s and throughout the 70s that may are maintained today. And I think we're doomed to repeat the, you know, repeat the um, wheel over and over again. If we don't start sharing this information, Apple Shop, like Judy Baca's Spark, like Liz Lehrman's <coughs> project, these are the quintessential early um, promoters and producers of this kind of art. Lorraine Leeson, I mean, yeah, I mean. Voices from the battle. Martha McGregor, <coughs> editor, Dudley everybody. So the point is only. I think it's on you guys also to, to learn about these histories and know who Dudley Cock is and know who Huey Smith is and Elizabeth. I think it's critical to understand the values that these projects came out of because they are not the values that are expressed in MFA programs or in social practice that you see in most museums. And I think that this is going to start to happen. I mean, it's, you know, I mean, one of the things that I think is so exciting about um, always about teaching, even though I don't like students very much, <laughs> you know, precisely for the sort of same reasons, you know, they're, you know, most of them are really interested in getting an A and uh, not, not much else. They're really not interested in the work, though I really had a wonderful time actually in Monterey with your students. Um, there is this, um, you know, this idea about legacy is absolutely critical, you know. And w when I'm when I'm when I'm teaching, um, it's it's the thing that I'm often encouraging my students to do, to really do this kind of research, do this kind of writing. That you know, we do have an. I feel that that I have an obligation as a teacher to really point students in very specific directions and to demand a certain kind of work from them and a certain level of investigation, a certain kind of investigation from them. And it's the kind of work that, you know, that I think uh, I would like to continue to do. Um, I'm very interested in the idea of like an oral history project. You know, one of the things that you said, you know, uh, Amaya, um, that I think is so important. Um, you know, I, I just have to say that um, <clears throat> in putting together this, um, 
this, 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 this day, thinking, thinking it through. I started thinking about it sometime in the, in the summer, early summer. And, um, you know, yes, that it needs to be a longer program, right? That the, uh, the, 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 the Art of Change initiative, I could use like another, you know, six months, a year, too easily to really sort of flush through, I think, a lot of the ideas that have really uh, began percolating. Um, but um, when, I, when I started putting it together, I really did want to know um, who was who, who was doing what. And, uh, and, and what were some of the issues and so what were some of the strategies, the strategies for working? And then, um, and then who were really some of the people that I really wanted to have in the room? And then um, a few, maybe a month or so ago, a month and a half ago, um, Amalia's name just floated in my head. And I can't even begin to tell you what it means. I say, out of everybody in the room, with the gift, the extraordinary gift that you've uh, brought to this day, that you've brought to the work, that you've brought to the field, that you've brought to the, uh, the, the level of commitment tenacity, insight, brilliance, compassion has just been extraordinary to watch. The, 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 you know, I was, I, was, I was listening in this room and I, and I was hearing a lot of frustration. There's a lot of frustration in the room, you know? But the one thing that you said that, that, that held like glue was what do you have? If you can start with what you have, then it moves you forward in a really profound way. That if, you can, if you're dwelling on what we don't have, right, then that's where you are. But if you start to open up that space of what do we have and then how do we use this to build on, then I think that maybe something really amazing and remarkable can come out of this. <clears throat> I want to encourage us to really figure out a way to, um, to reconvene. There are certain people that I'm very anxious to have further conversation with because of the specific work that you're doing. I'm hoping that that has happened for cross currents of you in any number of ways, that there are people that you want to bring into your circle, that they are mentors and people that uh, you need to know to learn from and to offer to. Right, to offer to. I am often available. I'm a busy girl, but I'm often available. My husband said, why don't you just make a couple of pictures? Why don't you just come home, come home, lay down. <laughs> you, know, you know, Maya's husband said, what, 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 where, are you, where are you going? Where are you going? You know, she said, I'm going to work. You know, I'm going to work. I am um, committed. I'm in it. I'm not going anywhere. It's my life. It's my work. It's uh, the only thing that I think about. How do I, in my time, um, bring it? <clears throat> bring what I know, this, this, little, this little stuff that I know, and make these little tiny incremental steps on the path. But I know that I've done as much as I could, I've done my job. Of course, I'm worried a little bit about my Love it. I want to roll in it. <laughs> you know? I want to roll in it. But more importantly, um, I am really thinking about the ideas, how to advance the ideas. And I've been advancing ideas long before anybody gave me any money. And we'll be doing that onward, right? And so my projects, no, they're not necessarily funded, the projects that I care most about. They're not. They probably won't be. That's all right. You know, I figured it out. And I think that this idea of, you know, really figuring out the connections, the connectors with, with how to make things happen, 
in your life and in your work and through, you know, just the, just, you know, like I love business too. I love figuring it out. I love really figuring out how to make all those dots work. So there are resources in this room, um, incredible people that are doing some important things. Some of you are doing things that are, and you're sort of struggling along, but you're doing them nonetheless, trying to work it out, trying to work it out and trying to figure out the details. Can I propose, again, several things, because it's really sort of wrap-up time. What we have in this room is, of course, incredible capacity on all kinds of levels, on all kinds of levels. <clears throat> I am going to um, ask the Ford Foundation to assist me in developing um, a website um, for this um, very specific project, or I'll just, uh, my assistant and I will work on it and we'll pull it all together. I'm hoping that maybe one or two people might volunteer to work along with me to sort of establish it and help me organize some of the materials that will go into it, but we'll start it and it'll be up in the next like couple of weeks. I'll just like knock that part out and then we'll figure out how to pull. I would like all of you to sort of think about contributing to it in some, in some way, whatever way you want to, but in some way, right? And, and then more importantly, I would really like to think about the idea and I'd like to see a show of hands of people that would be interested in convening in June. June. And, um, and uh, would we be able to convene at, at, uh, at Dorchester Projects? Is that a, is that a, um, right? 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 So um, we'll have to figure out, you know, you'll have to figure out how to get there, but we'll be there. Right? You know, they'll, you know, the Astro will feed us and we'll have a, a place to convene and maybe we'll be able to figure out how to beat some bushes and shake some leaves and maybe a couple of coins will fall someplace, but start saving your money. And um, <clears throat> with that, um, I'm not really sure what more I need to say other than I am um, absolutely honored, uh, deeply gratified that you were all able to come today and to share your ideas and to begin, to begin um, a process of uh, a thinking through uh, our work and our effort in this um, uh, space of art and possibility, art and change, art and practice, art and revolution. Thank you so much for joining us. There's cocktails outside. <laughs>